Hey, folks, today's episode of WTF is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace recently launched the latest version of their platform, Squarespace 7. There's a completely redesigned interface, and it works with Google Apps, and you can use Getty Images on your site. There are 15 new templates to create your website and an incredible new feature called Cover Pages. Try the new Squarespace with a free trial at squarespace.com and enter offer code WTF at checkout to get 10% off. Squarespace, start here, go anywhere. All right, let's do the show. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers, what the fuck buddies, what the fucking ears, what the fuck sticks, what the fuck stirs? I am Mark Marin. This is WTF. Mike Judge is on the show today. I've always wanted to talk to Mike Judge because I always knew he'd come from my hometown, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I figured we could talk about that for a while. Like, I I literally believe that we have friends in common, that we, I, we didn't go to the same high school, but we're around the same age. So there's a bit of that in this uh, conversation, connecting about Albuquerque. I've been I've been very nostalgic lately. I, I don't know if it's I don't like to call it nostalgia, but I'm sort of trying to sort things out. I kind of go on these missions into my memories to try to, you know, kind of target where it went wrong. I'm on, on I'm on these stealth missions into my memories and I just stand there. I'm like, look at what's going on here. This might be something. Why are you in that hotel room? That I think that's a problem. And I pull out. Then I kind of regroup, and I'm like, we're going back in. Let's go back in. Let's go back to that hotel room. All right, so this looks like sophomore year of high school. Uh, you're in a hotel room. That's your buddy Dave. That's Chris. Chris, that's Chris. Oh, you got. I remember this. You guys have just taken a handful of yellow jackets, and those two guys, yep, they're both making out with girls on the both beds, and you're just standing there like an asshole because your girl split. And now, yep, there you, yep, that's, yep, you're going to break those two giant bottles, those glass Sprite bottles that we're using to mix with and uh, make a scene and ruin the party. All right, let's pull out. I'm out. I'm out. Yeah, those are the memories. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Dotson B210, first car. Got it as a gift from my parents right after I took a, finished my classes at McGinnis Driver School. McGinnis Driver's Ed. Drove around that car, wrecked it the first month, combing my hair in the rear view. Car put that car through a lot. A lot of driving. A lot of drinking and driving at age four, 15. Hanging out in front of liquor stores. Dude, you get us a pint of Southern, a six of Heinies. Get us a pint of Southern, six of Millers. Dude, can you give me a half pint of Jack, six of Millers? Dude, can you get us a pint of Southern? Who are the people that got us that stuff? I think we were kids. I was 15 driving around. There was gunplay. Albuquerque was exciting. Driving out with my buddy Dave. He's dead now. Me and Dave in the 73 Firebird with the Holly Double Pumper. Bored out cylinder heads, whatever that means. Fast fucking car. His dad owned a stereo store, so he always had a good stereo. Me, Dave, Bob, Brian, Chris. Damon, some combination of that, running around, drinking booze, driving around in the car. Then Dave, he's always having problems with the Firebirds. We got a Scirocco, Volkswagen Scirocco. Then someone, we just cruise around, cruise around the McDonald's. Let's go to Highland High McDonald's. I go to Highland High. We all got our own McDonald's. Let's go buy the McDonald's. He was hanging out, cruising to McDonald's. Dave and Andy were out cruising some other McDonald's. Up by Eastdale, some guy shot a bullet right into his car, right into Dave's car, shot a bullet. Never got along with Andy. Don't know what happened to that guy. Dave is dead. Mentioned that, right? All right, let's go. Let's go down the memory hole. Here we go. All right, I'm driving. I'm driving my car. I got a pint of Jack because that's what I drink. I drink pint of Jack and I drink it fast. Don't like beer. It's too filling. Damon's with me. I think Pete's in the back. Pete came. Hey, he wasn't really, he didn't hang out with us too much, but we went by his house. That's right. It was me and Damon, and we went by Pete's house because we were going to drive up to Santa Fe. There was a game. It was a game between Santa Fe and Highland. I didn't care about football, but I wanted to hang out. That's what I was about. Let's hang out. What's everyone doing? Yeah, I'll drive. 
I'll drive and we'll go to the football game. So I'm driving and go by Pete's house. And I remember we got like a fifth of passport scotch. We stole a, like a fifth of passport scotch from Pete's dad's liquor cabinet. And that's what I was drinking. Cause I didn't want to drink beer. So I'm pouring passport scotch into soda, Coca Cola. We drive to uh, Santa Fe, right? We drive to Santa Fe to the football game. I kind of remember that. It's an hour away. Kind of remember that. I remember walking into the game. I remember looking up at the stands, and a lot of my high school was in the stands. It was cold out, and I was shit-faced. And I remember dropping to my knees in front of everybody in my high school and laughing hysterically. And then I was walked up the bleachers by a couple of friends, probably Pete and maybe Damon, and they sat me in the bleachers, and then I don't know what happened. All I know is that I was laying in the bleachers, and then and then the next thing I know, uh, there was some, like, I remember being cold, and then I remember waking up and for a quick moment, and Damon's holding his hand up, and it's all bloody. His fist is all bloody, and we're, we're driving. And then the next thing I know, I wake up at, in Albuquerque at the McDonald's, and I'm alone, and I'm in a booth, and I got my head in my hands, and I wake up, and I don't know where my car is. I don't know where Damon is. I don't know nothing. And all of a sudden, people start coming in from the game. All the cheerleaders and the jocks and all the people, all the people I didn't like, but were around because I wanted to hang around with people. No idea what happened. Then some kid comes up to me and he goes, dude, you were, you were on your back in the bleachers throwing up on you like a fountain. Like a fountain. You were just throwing up. You look like a fountain. I'm like, what? And then some girl I had a crush on. After he went to go get a milkshake or something, she walked up to me, and I was like, hey, how's it going? Trying to be cool, not knowing the history of my evening because of a blackout. And she goes, why do you have rice in your hair? Yeah, that's how that night ended. Then Damon came with my car. He had gotten into a fight. That's what happened. Drove somebody home. Then got in my car and went home. High school, Albuquerque, New Mexico, before... I committed my life to the art department. Those are the trying days of trying to be accepted by the cool kids. And then I went to the art department and became a, uh, <laughs> a, a high school artist. Anyways, Mike Judge is here. We went to high school in the same city in different high schools. Life is hectic, folks. And when it gets like that, Sometimes it's hard to make the best snacking choices. Believe me, I know. I've been in a writer's room for the last several weeks. TV writers eat garbage. Thankfully, there's NatureBox.com. They've got more than a 100 nutritionist-approved snacks. NatureBox has something for everyone, all with zero artificial flavors, colors, or sweetness, no trans fats, no high-fructose corn syrup, great snacks, bold flavors, and none of that nonsense. I'm looking on NatureBox.com right now. Why bother with greasy chips and vending machine chocolate when you could get Santa Fe corn sticks or dark cocoa almonds? Why? And right now you can try NatureBox for free with a trial box featuring five of their most popular snacks. Go start it now at NatureBox.com slash WTF. You know you're going to snack. You know. You know you are. So get smart about it with NatureBox. Go to NatureBox.com slash WTF now for a free trial box of great snacks. I just remember something. Uh, senior prom, I'd like, can I just, maybe it was junior prom. I'd just like to put it out. I just want to apologize to Cam, Cam McCullough. Uh, that was a bad night, and uh, I was rude. I apologize. That just, I just remembered that. Yeah, high school, man. There's so many stories. So many stories that revolve around vomit, around uh, coming in my pants, around... Uh, around bad grades, around long car rides that don't end well. I do remember one time me and Dead Dave drove to Santa Fe. And I don't know what we did up there, but we were driving back. It was night. It was late at night. And we were driving back on old Highway 14 that runs behind the mountains, behind the Sandias, through Madrid, the ghost town, but it was night and the moon was big and it was bright and we were stoned and we listened to Pink Floyd animals in its entirety driving on a dead highway, just me and Dave 
moving through the night, following the moon, listening to Pink Floyd animals. And when Pigs on a Wing came on, what song is that with the guitar solo, man? Oh, I just got chills. I just got chills. Folks, if you listen to this show, if you listen to podcast period, you've heard about Squarespace. It's the best way to build your own website. And now there's the latest version, Squarespace 7, not 6, 7. Seven's the key number here. Think about it. Seven elevens, seven dwarves, seven man. That's the number. Seven. It's a completely new design, and now it's even easier to make your own website. You can integrate Google Apps into your site, so you can connect the site to Gmail, use Google Spreadsheets, all that stuff. You can get 40 million high-quality photos for your site through Getty Images. That's what the professionals use, folks, so that's that's what you're going to be using. Find out more about all the new features at squarespace.com slash 7. That's a lot of S's. Of course, the classic Squarespace features are still there. Beautiful design templates, 24-7 customer support, free online stores, and it looks great on whatever computer or device you're using. Start a trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code WTF to get 10% off your first purchase and to show your support for our podcast. That's squarespace.com, promo code WTF. We're going to talk to Albuquerque's own Mike Judge here in a minute. That's how I see him. The guy from Albuquerque. Let's talk to him now. Mike Judge. St. Pius High School. So you're a year ahead of me. Yeah. I was graduated when I was 17, though, so. My brother went to Pius. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's a, oh but God. he's two and a half years younger than me, so I don't know that you would have known him. My sister would have known him. Probably. What, what's his name? Craig Marin. Wow. He was a tennis guy. I don't remember. I, I, I knew some people Wait, that so went. You went. Oh, we must know a ton of the same people. We must have common friends. I always wondered that. Yeah. If um, I'm trying to think. I went who, to Albuquerque High one semester, and I know a lot of those people, but... um. I had a couple of friends who went to Albuquerque High. Devin Jackson was a I know him. You do? <laughs> or I did. In junior high, I knew him. Really? Yeah, Devin Jackson, Ty Montague. Ty Montague, know? dude. He ended up going to... Wait, are we on? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Ty Montague ended up... Um... He's a big advertising guy, dude. Yeah, in, in New York. And yeah. When, it was fun, when Beavis and Butthead was happening, I was... When it was first getting going, I was in uh, this guy's office at MTV, Abby Turkuli, and, and uh, he said... Uh, Oh, yeah, tell Ty Montague I'll call him back. And I thought, you know, I'm in Manhattan, and I'm like, how many Ty Montagues are? And I yeah. said, is he from Albuquerque? He said, oh, I don't know. He's a, he works at Shiat Day or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I said, ask him if he's from Albuquerque. And he's like, all right. And turned out he was the Ty Montague that I do when I was in, like, seventh grade. <laughs> yeah. But him and Devin Jackson were friends, right? Yeah. Devin got into writing, didn't he? Yeah, Devin, yeah. Uh, you know, he was a ball player probably when you knew him, basketball. His yeah, he dad, basketball. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he's... He did. He wrote a book, and you know he's still a writer. He lives out in Santa Fe, and uh, he's got a kid and a, an ex-wife, and you know the regular <laughs> stuff. Like all of us. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I I don't have the kid, but I got a couple ex-wives. Uh, yeah, and his dad was friends with my dad. His dad used to be the uh, the physician over at uh, at the University Health Clinic. Oh right, I remember Dan Jackson. I've been talking about. Do you remember Captain Billy? Oh hell yeah! Like you know, he got shot. Yeah, I remember. Did you go on the Captain Billy show? No, a little. I, I went on like on your birthday. You would go on and sit in the bleachers. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Didn't my uncle went? worked at that station and knew him. My uncle. At, where was he on KOB? Uh, uh, he was on KOAT, wasn't he? Okay, KOAT. K- there, Channel there was, Seven. Is the that competing. Channel? There was Uncle Roy and Captain Billy were the competing uh, <laughs> children's show guys, and I don't know how it came down for you, but I remember my mom. Like I'd heard that he'd been shot, right, and that he was with some guy's wife, right. That's what my dad said. My dad's a doctor, and he was at the hospital when they brought him in. Oh, he was right, oh, and that's God. the information oh. I got. Then I recently went back and did some research on it because I've been talking about it on stage about yeah. childhood memories, and the angle of the bit was that you know my father came home, you know, and I was like seven or however old we were. Yeah, that's about yeah. Right, that's and he said seven. you know someone shot Captain Billy, and in my brain I'm like how. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I mean, you yeah, watched what? Captain Billy. That's yeah, why I saw that cartoons for the exactly. first time. Was, really? Yeah. 
And and like I couldn't even. But my dad, being as inappropriate as he was, I said, "Why would anyone shoot Captain Billy?" He's like, "Well, some guy caught him screwing his wife." <laughs> and in the joke is, in retrospect, that's really the most important thing I learned from Captain Billy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. Like that's that was my. I mean, I watched Captain Billy every morning, and yeah, I remember. S- first hearing maybe from one of the neighborhood kids that captain billy well i'd heard he'd been murdered and and that he that he was screwing somebody's wife and then i remember asking my mom about it this was kind of she was trying to soft pedal it to me i guess and she goes she said well it could be that he was just sort of giving her a friendly pat on the back and it was misinterpreted (laughs) like not tarnish captain billy for me (laughs) But um, <laughs> or or make you understand what it could possibly mean yeah, really. to be fucking some guy's yeah. wife. <laughs> just, there's a lot of it's just such a dark, like typical of Albuquerque. Like you know, you're just the local childhood guy. But then I remember years later, my uncle worked at that station. And he was yeah. saying that he thought Captain Billy was gay. But well, here's what I heard uh, was that well, what I went and did some research on, it, and somebody had set out to clear Captain Billy's name and said that it was a, a lunatic. A lunatic, like he was doing a pledge drive or something on TV, and this guy's g- wife was on the show on the you know one of the phone bank people, and Captain Billy came and like put his arm around yeah, see, her. Then or I something. heard that what my mom said may have been partially true. Right, like and it wasn't it, the guy was paranoid, delusional. Right, yeah. right, and he had had you know he had been on the inside in a mental hospital before, yeah. and it was uh, there was more to the story. It, it would not help my joke. <laughs> so like yeah. yeah like the information I got was the information I got and yeah. I don't need that I I need to <laughs> retroactively yeah, well, make your joke well, not well work. just sort of like if there's yeah. any people that are related to Captain Billy or need to know the story and do like a sort of an addendum to my act yeah <laughs> but it was, right I think I first saw like Heckle and Jekyll and he used to run some of those old cartoons yeah all the Tex Avery stuff and you know Roadrunners they they'd play all the old Warner Brothers stuff right and it was I mean that's where I first Saw that stuff. And, and you remember that? It. Oh, yeah. You yeah, were obsessed it, with cartoons at that point? Yeah. Yeah, I would have... In fact, I had... Um, it's another Albuquerque thing. I had one of the first weird car- cartoon dreams I had. Remember this Ed Black's Chevrolet and yeah. that crow? Yeah. It was it was a really weird drawing of a crow because right. it was just facing camera. You usually draw a crow from the side because that so it's just the, like these... It's a crow, yeah. The beak part. It was just a circle face, weird... Or oval face. Um... You had a dream that that crow was like 200 feet tall and it was like going through the streets with a pitchfork stabbing people. <laughs> but it was animated. It was like kind of a cartoon. Of Ed dream. Black Chevrolet. <laughs> Ed Black Chevrolet. There was, there was Ed Black's. There was Gallus. It's so funny that it's such a specific landscape. It's weird because I'm making up for something here. I had Brian Cranston in here, you know, and, oh. you know, they shoot all that in, in our hometown in Albuquerque. Yeah, yeah it's. it's that show is one of the first to really because they shoot so much stuff there. But when yeah. I watch Breaking Bad, I was, that really that's <laughs> feels like Albuquerque. Right, they use that oh, octopus yeah. car wash or whatever the hell it was. Oh, I mean, yeah, that's like a landmark yeah. to me. Yeah, and uh, in the in the Albuquerque Bank Building, they even that's yeah. in uh, No Country for Old Men too. They that, they say that's shot in Texas, but in that shootout scene at the end of No Country for Old oh, Men, the... you see the First National Bank Building right there, and anyone who's lived in Albuquerque, yeah, yeah, they shot it right there at like Central and what is that San Mateo in one of those hotels right yeah, there. There was that, and then there was, yeah, Kistler Collister. Kistler Collister, yeah. right there with the department store over on uh, that was on on was San Mateo Lomas. And Lomas. San Mateo, yeah. yeah, but that hasn't been Kistler Collister forever. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what the hell that is now. <laughs> There's so many weird memories that happen when you when you grow up a place. Like I remember walking to that food way. I remember the first time I got you know dragged home by some guy, uh, not in a bad way, right. but like I remember one time me and my butt, my kid brother were going down to i think it was called foodway yeah, yeah, I, don't yeah think no, they, I totally remember yeah that. i don't think they exist anymore but we decided for some fucked up reason we were going to crawl across san pedro to <laughs> and, and some guy decided he would you know walk us home and tell my parents about that like i don't know what's wrong with your kids but they decided they're going to crawl on the street but i remember like well cranston was in here and i i was so nervous about the interview i completely forgot to even make albuquerque a point of reference and i knew places he was eating like there's one scene where they ate at a place called taco sal's which is like way up on like Eubank or Juan to Bow. Oh, okay. and, and it's in a strip mall, but it's a great Mexican place. The only reason I knew about it is because my buddy Dave's dad owned a store up there that we worked at, and we went and ate there. I met Vince Gilligan, and yeah. uh, we talked to Albuquerque for a while. Uh, you know, uh, 
Yeah, it's just a lot of the same, um, well, frontier restaurant. That's, that was like so important of, to me, man. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I spent so much time. In my, I spent a lot of high school in frontier. Yeah, high school. Yeah, that was, and, and one of my best friends worked there, and it was just a, uh, Still, best. that's still there. It's, it's still, still good. It's really good, yeah. Uh, well, my, uh, one of my mentors early on was Gus Blaisdell, and he used to own the Living Batch Bookstore, which was right next door to uh, Frontier oh, yeah. for a while. Bearded dude was a uh, real smart guy. I worked at the Posh Bagel across from Yale Park when I was in <laughs> high school, like yeah, when I was going to Highland. Right there, there was a bagel place. It didn't last long. It was next to the guitar shop, and there was Budget Records. On, oh, right oh, on, by Highland High School? No, right the, across from the university, right on Central. Oh, oh right there, yeah. Right yeah. around the corner from the, the general store. And Natural Sound was on Harvard. Oh, totally. Yeah. And then the guitar shop had that wooden front to it, like right there. Did you so ever go in at, there? Uh, yeah, I used to go to those because my dad was a professor for a long time. He was an archaeology professor at UNM. And, really? Uh, yeah, and an, and an archaeologist. Like he, uh, but but yeah, I used to, I used to go over there. But um, I was also in the Albuquerque Youth Symphony, and we would uh, so Pope Joy Hall was we right rehearse, there. and then yeah, Saturdays we'd wander around. Yeah, those, those places right. after rehearsal. What'd you play? Uh, I played trombone back then. I played Tr- upright bass also, but the, but when I in the youth symphony, I was playing trombone. Yeah. So you start playing music really young. Yeah, like fifth grade. Trombone, so you can read music and you can do all that. Yeah, trombone. But Boy, uh, that's I don't, I don't play instrument. that anymore. <laughs> it's a hell of an instrument. I, I got a bass when I was in high school and started doing that, and then upright bass. But uh, yeah, trombone. You got it's one of those things like violin. You got to. You have to stay on it, and you know, like yeah. your, your lip, is, you know, like for me to play now, I would have to, yeah, you know, it take a long time to get back <laughs> to work out with a with the, yeah. whatever you call it, the mouthpiece. Yeah, the uh, yeah. well, trombone's one of those ones where you can't sort of like I'm just gonna hang out at home and jam. Yeah, you that's that's the other problem. Upright bass is like that too. It's not, but you uh, can go on you runs. Can, yeah, you can just yeah. still, but yeah, trombone, you kind of want to play with people or in a horn section. Or something. Was that the original uh, idea, musician? Yeah, I thought about it. I mean, I, I, I guess I took to it pretty naturally, and I did. You know, I was, yeah, I was gonna. I just didn't. Um, maybe when I was really young, but no. I mean, by the time I was in high school, it was just. Uh, you know, you had to go into science. Was the idea? Was that was <laughs> that the idea that you grew up with? I mean, I well, I don't even like an archaeologist. What kind of digs did your dad do? What was his? He was his uh, focus. The the Anasazi was his thing. He was Chaco Canyon. Oh yeah. Uh, well, he started when I was a really little. He was basically the Anasazi in the you know pre-Columbian before Columbus. So your dad did, was on digs, and he he was uh, yeah. is he like a preeminent Anasazi guy? Yeah, he's pretty. I mean, in in that world, yeah. He um, uh, this this author Jared Diamond who wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel, yeah. like Pulitzer Prize guy. He, I was meeting with him when I was doing the movie Idiocracy, and at some point he. he uh, Why were you meeting with him for that movie? That Fox had said, okay, you know, let's hire a futurist. And I was just, you know, I'd read Guns, Germs, and Steel and Collapse. And I was like, a futurist. Can, can you hook me up with Jared Diamond? I just kind of was a big fan of his yeah. writing. And I just yeah. thought I'll use this to to try to meet him. And his kids were huge Beavis and Butthead fans. He has these twin sons who are super genius. But at the time, they were like 13. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so, anyway, he, um, yeah, at some point, like, during the interview, I said my dad was an archaeologist, and then I got an email from him the next day, and he said, "Is your dad the Jim Judge? Maybe the only person who would ever say this, <laughs> <laughs> and like the guy who did." And there's something in his book, I think, "Collapse," about just pack rat shit that preserves itself, and <laughs> like right. my dad had something to do with. It. And he's cited in 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 a Jared Diamond book, like as further reading about the Anasazi. One oh, of, really? One of my dad's books. Yeah. So, well, that must have like been. he's no, it's really cool actually. I mean, he's and he's he's been in documentaries and National Geographic articles and things like that. And so he's still was, around. Uh huh. And he's your, retired, but what's your mom do? She was uh, actually she she was a teacher at Highland for a while. Come on, yeah. Spanish <laughs> really? taught Spanish and French, and then she became a. Uh, elementary school librarian. She got tired of the high school teaching. I don't know how the hell high school teachers do it. Oh, it I was no fucking it was idea. Rough, especially in Albuquerque, it was rough. I yeah, mean, and at the time we grew up, it was rougher. It seemed like it was pretty. Like I remember, I think it, it was rougher. It seems like it. Yeah. You no, know, definitely. I mean, there was a time where it was like one of the, the second most violent cities in yeah, the Albuquerque in, in yeah. the country. There was a. I think in the seventies, it was there was a couple of years in a row where it was the highest per capita violent crime right. cities in the country. 
I don't remember really seeing that, but I do remember you know, like the the great thing about growing up in New Mexico is you could get your driver's license when you're like 15. It was a while, 14 and nine months. Before you get, get the yeah, owner's I, permit. I remember a friend in my high school hadn't gone through puberty yet and had his driver's license. He looked like a little eight-year-old driving around. He'd did get pulled over all the time. Did you get your permit at 14, nine months? Uh, 15. Where'd you go from uh, from Albuquerque? UC San Diego. Oh, really? Which was kind of a... Um, wasn't my first choice. I'd actually I wanted to go to UT Austin, and something got. I, I ended up getting accepted, but something got screwed up with. I don't know my application or the acceptance letter. I didn't get it, or I, I found out uh, too late, as I recall. And then it. I don't know. I really don't know why I went to UCSD. It was just kind of. I I told my guidance counselor I wanted to just go somewhere in the Southwest, and she just put that on the list, and I applied. And I was saying engineering and music stuff, and that just came up. And what what did you end up studying? Uh, physics. Got a physics degree. Uh, did you do well? <laughs> I did. I was a. I did well considering I hardly went to class. I did. Was kind of known for, just like I would start going to class and then I would just realize I'm not paying attention. I'm just learning everything from the book anyway. And yeah. So and, and then I discovered you know, now with the internet I think you can educate yourself. Back then I discovered I could just go to the engineering library and just get better books on the same topic than. Seemed like they always picked the worst books for some of these, like some of these classes, and so I ended up. Um, I did. I got straight B's. Yeah. And uh, well, they're trying to get a lot into those textbooks, I guess, and they might not explain it as fully as they could. Yeah, and some of them, some physics textbooks, they almost pride themselves. Engineer types and physics almost pride themselves on not explaining it very well. Sure. Like, oh, you don't get it. Yeah. Oh, you know, and and you could find these other books that would have better explanations and tons of practice problems. They break the code. Yeah, it's like philosophy too. It's like you got to speak the language, but it's English. Yeah, I mean, you can't. Why does everything have to have a, have a different definition than what it really is? Yeah, there's a lot of that in the academic world. And yeah, well, it's how they, that's how it sustains itself. Yeah, they, you need us to decode job, it. Job security. Yeah. yeah. Well, what what were you thinking with uh, with physics? I mean, what was the what was well, the point? Well, I started out in engineering, and I was just gonna I was gonna get an engineering job. That's it. I was, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about what a big nerd they are. When I was in high school. I had a ham radio license when I was 12, <laughs> so I was kind of an electronics guy, and I thought, okay, I'll just be an engineer and get a job, and then, you know, back then they'd tell you, oh, if you get a science degree, you get a, they'll just, people be handing you jobs like it's in, you Here's know, some money. Yeah, and it's just not true, but but I, uh, I, was, I was in engineering and then just realized physics was fewer uh, class requirements. No, so it was a practical thing. Believe it or not, it was a little easier for me to get a physics degree. I'm, I think I'm better at the conceptual stuff than the. I mean, it's uh, maybe I'm not explaining that right, but just stuff that's more pure math and physics rather than just here's twenty engineering problems, right? Or Forty engineering problems, and um, you have to be able to wrap your brain around the abstract to get physics, correct? Yeah, I think I, so. And and I, I was, I could I. I was, I guess, better at that, but, and also I, you know, you can, I realized you could still supposedly get engineering jobs with a physics degree and. What is, so. I never, I'm never clear what that means. What's an engineering job? It can be, a, be a lot of different stuff. So right. my, my first job was actually the F-18 fighter jet, all the electronics that test itself and the software that yeah. tests itself. Now, now it's very common in cars, everything, you know, you got to, gives you a, you got the your rear flasher is off your is is broken or whatever right it was the f eighteen it was just all its self test stuff <laughs> yeah and I was working for a company that did that and really so, um, that made the plane or just that panel no they just they just did the test software for the so you were that. you were already proficient at computers that something else you learned i, I, mean, I did like, i done yeah I'd done some programming, but this was actually this job that I was on we were Going through all their software and trying to find and the schematics and trying to find failures that the software wouldn't catch, and so we were evaluating. But this was like '85, and the F-18 was all over the news because of Top Gun, I guess. And but it was really not working very well at the time. <laughs> like they would fly, like when they bombed Gaddafi. Yeah, I remember like in the at the office because like, we were on Coronado Island, and, yeah. and and they were like saying, hey, you know, the the F-18s just flew on it on that mission for. Publicity and for for uh, for using their radar, I guess. Oh right, so but the bombs were dropped by uh, whatever those 
Oh, they couldn't trust the, Yeah, they yeah. couldn't trust the F-18 to do the bombing. But yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but now it, the uh, public likes the F-18. Yeah, but now I mean the but now F-18. I mean they they had worked out the kinks. So, so the, you were just working for a military contractor. Yeah, and that and you just got that job out of college. Yeah, I got just sending resumes around. And you were just in a room full of guys, so like I picture like the right stuff. No, <laughs> it wasn't. Anyway. It was literally <laughs> cubicles. I, I kind of modeled a lot of office space after my first two jobs, and this was it was just gray cubicles with schematics on them and piles of software and a computer, and it wasn't glamorous at all. <laughs> no guys w- sitting around with models of things. No, that I mean, occasionally I would have to go on base, and you'd get to go look at an F eighteen in, in the distance. <laughs> say, oh, there's an aircraft car- carrier, but I was going, I was going to look up like if a part was obsolete or something. <laughs> you <laughs> so uh, just going to a counter with a guy. Do you know if this part still exists? But occasionally, like if I don't know if I look at my Wikipedia page or something, and it, it's true, it, like technically I worked on the F eighteen, but I wasn't out on an F eighteen right. on a carrier, <laughs> giving a thumbs up to somebody. <laughs> you know, yeah, it was a, just, a few way, a few removed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what? Was, so you worked there for a while, and then and then what happened? <clears throat> um, I lasted about a year there, and then I moved up to. Well, I was actually playing music the whole time. I was playing like three nights a week with uh, this kind of George Thorogood type guy, this sort of drunken slide blues player. Who, and I was actually paying pretty good. And then I, I moved up to the Who Bay Who was that? Area. What guy was that? His name was Blonde Bruce. <laughs> yeah? Is he a blues guy? Yeah. He, this is a long time ago. Are you a blues guy? Um, I mean, that's that's just what I yeah got... I started playing that and got more blues gigs, and I played upright bass, too, so it was sort of like... Could you slap bass do the whole Yeah, thing? I did, like, the slap rockabilly thing. I always wanted to play more rockabilly country, but all the gigs I got would be blues bands. Was that the music you liked in high school? I went through a phase where I was really... Yeah, I was really into, like, Elmore James and all this Right, me like, too, man. Really, like... Yeah. Brownie McGee, Sonny Terry, all these, like, old blues guys. Yeah, so you got the blues brain. I do, too, man. Yeah, I saw a lot of these guys, too. I saw... I saw Brownie McGee and really, was, yeah. Where one of the, um, I saw him in San Diego at the Belly Up. Oh, really? When you were in college? Like, yeah, it was they like were. 19, it's weird because a fake ID. We were. How'd you get your fake ID? Um, the first one, actually, I don't know if you ever did this in Albuquerque. A friend of mine. I hope to get. You I would make to... a giant poster, right? Yes. Did look. <laughs> yeah, I got the same ID. <laughs> The cut out where yeah. you stick your head? You, you do a color card and you put your head and then you'd cut it <laughs> Right. You'd cut it out. I, I, you'd, you'd sign the name with a big Sharpie so it looked like a when it was reduced down to size. Right. It would, yeah. <laughs> but the the weird thing about the board I got is that the guy couldn't change the information on the board. So me and my buddies all got fake IDs, but they all had the same yeah, fucking yeah, same name. Here. Yeah, my friend, I won't say his name, but he, he, uh, he got a... His brother worked at the airport, and they had the binder. But so, so he, he took a picture of a Wyoming driver's license right. and blew it up with an overhead projector, traced it all out. So whatever the guy, whatever the fake name was, in fact, he even put his three-year-old nephew up there and gave him a fake ID. <laughs> and he was 21 just for fun. I remember my name. My name was Tom Bynes. <laughs> It'd be so hilarious if it was That's your it. buddy who was making those. Because we did it at a party or something. So oh, just everybody stepped up. Yeah, and, yeah, people who wanted to buy it could buy it. Yeah. Well, yeah. that was the amazing thing, and also we'll get back to where you went. But uh, the 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 thing about Beavis and Butthead, and the thing that like obviously the entire world r- responded to it, but it felt very familiar to me because there was a certain. Well, they, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was because it was you were from Albuquerque, and I knew that. But there's a weird thing that happens when you can drive at 15, but you can't drink till you're 21 because it's sort yes. of weird and yeah. dangerous. But like everyone's going to get booze, and most of us when we grew up like that, we were driving around with six packs and going up to the rocks and you know hanging yeah. on the mountain. But all you did in Albuquerque was drink and drive around. Right. There was nowhere to go. And yeah. Yeah. You would get like, I mean, we, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy, like how lawless it seemed. Like, I, I remember getting in, uh, coming out of a movie and my friend, like a bunch of us get in the back of his pickup truck and he just, it was over kind of by where St. Pius was, that theater. And there was a big vacant lot. The one rock. He just like, yeah. Uh, or, Louisiana. Yeah, Coronado or Winter. Yeah. yeah. And he just like. Yes, same area. He just like jumps a divider, jumps a curve, and just starts doing donuts in this vacant lot. And Hell just yeah. right out there, you could see it from Lomas, from, <laughs> and just no one ever seemed to it's get so pulled fun. over by the cops. And, yeah, it was funny because like that, I do, I've been in that car. Let's yeah. just fucking go do donuts. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. We used to get shopping carts in the mall parking lot at Wenrock. 
Like uh-huh. after, like we drink all night driving around, then we get shopping carts and put them in front of my buddy's Firebird and just get them going about 40 or 50 miles an hour and just let them <laughs> destroy themselves on the curbs. And that was like a big night. But there was something about that weird frustration that having access to a car and access to liquor. Yeah, and nowhere and be, to go. Like, and no girls. And you couldn't go to, like no one owned a house, so you could, you know. Yeah. You, <laughs> you had to drink outside somewhere. Yeah, maybe someone's parents would be out of town, but you're just. Oh, yeah, just and, destroy that place. Destroy the place with no parents. Yeah, it was, it was, it's really, yeah, you could have a license. I, I, we had a, um, a pickup truck that a guy had left for my dad. It was a, it was a Datsun before anyone knew about Datsun. It was like a 59 Datsun. You could actually crank start it if it, if the starter motor didn't work. They've been work. around that long time. Yeah, yeah that but well, time. these were, you hardly ever see these because they, they weren't, they, somehow this guy had one. Right. And he, to avoid the draft, went to Canada. Yeah. And then I guess he ended up, he couldn't come back, and then I think he ended up dying or something. But we just inherited this truck that was, and that we was learned your, to fix yeah. co- engines on it. But we could, like, if there were three of us, we could each pitch in a dollar and have enough gas to drive, you know, you learned how to work all on night cars? long. And, yeah, on, on that car mostly. And, you know, my dad and my brother did. But That was your first car, kind of? Yeah, we sort of, nobody really owned it. <laughs> how many brothers you got? Uh, just one, and then one sister. Yeah, well, I and also there was a lot of guns around. And yeah, that's <laughs> like I saw several guns in high school. Yeah, <laughs> some guy pulling you aside, going, "Check this out!" I'm like, "Holy shit!" Oh yeah, I, we got shot at once outside out one night. You know. Oh, I mean, I so, so I worked at uh, Jack in the Box and Whataburger. <laughs> Which Whataburger? Uh, the one I don't know if it's there anymore. It was on. It was kind of down in Martinez Town. On, yeah, uh, on Lomas, but downtown below Rio Grande. Yeah, and I remember there was a Navajo Indian guy, Jonathan, and this other guy, Larry, who sort of, you know how, like, Native Americans and rednecks kind of hung out? Yeah, <laughs> there's, they, a, there's a flannel. There's the country, uh, yeah. yeah, they, yeah. And, and, uh, but he used to say, uh, he'd go like, he'd go, yeah, yeah, you know, me and Larry, you know, sometimes, you know, we just go out on the West Mesa, you know, and just shoot at cars. <laughs> It's like, fuck, are you kidding me? I was, this is my first job, I think I was 16, or not my first job, I'd worked other jobs, but yeah. like at a... And then he, uh, one day he goes, uh, he goes, hey man, you want to go out after work with me and Larry? He's like, oh, what are you going to do? He goes, oh, we're just going to go roll queers. And I, 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 didn't, I didn't know what that meant. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you know, kick their ass, take their money. I was like, ah, uh, yeah, I can't tonight. I'm, uh, I was such a gringo. It's like, well, uh, you, yeah, no, I don't think I'm going to go beat up fags sound, with you guys. This does sound fun. Yeah. But, uh, oh, God. It, well, that's the weird thing is that, like, when we grew up, it was like, it had to be 60 or 70% Latino, easily. Yeah, it always Chicago. felt like, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, we were the ones that were, you know. Yeah, I was, at Jefferson Junior High, I felt like I was the minority, you know. And oh, yeah. Even at St. Pius, it was it was more mellow, I suppose, than a. I didn't feel, but I never got a sense of tension until like cholo started happening. Like yeah. there was always, it was always more sort of disco oriented and yeah. you know, platform <laughs> shoes. And then all of a sudden something happened. Yeah, something you know, Viva the, La Raza. Yeah, and, and the Chicano power movement. Yeah, and, and it was kind of like, yeah, I distinctly remember a guy I used to ride the bus with, uh, Richard Quintana, and he was, we were really good friends. And all of a sudden, just at some point, like at a certain age, yeah. he couldn't be seen with me. Right. Like and a, then the uh, gang started happening yeah. a bit. Yeah. And the, and the, like the, the flannel shirts, right. only buttoned at the top yeah. with the white shirt and the, and the yeah. bandanas. It just all changed. Suddenly got, yeah. Yeah. So after, uh, San Diego, you, where'd you get the, where you, this is when you got the job in Silicon Valley? Yeah. I went up there. My, my, uh, ex wife, we were in, my girlfriend at the time had, was from Palo Alto and she'd gone back and I thought I'd give it a go up there and uh yeah then I had I had an engineering job and then I started playing music again and all through it you played bass huh yeah and I uh and then after that I played bass for a living for like five years almost for until Beavis and Butthead really yeah the engineering jobs up there I had one that lasted like three or four months and another one two months but but did it give you a sense of, like, was it really the kernels of your understanding of Silicon Valley, or was it just another job? Well, that, I, it was, it was kind of the kernels of my understanding of it, because I just, I mean, that was, the job in San Diego, military contractor, whatever, it was, that was sort of like cubicle, dreary, whatever, but yeah. this was a whole different, they were like cults or something, it was very weird, it's, I, I feel like it's still like that up there, and I just, just didn't fit in, but. A, a cult um, of I've, product, a cult I'm of just kind of believing in what we're doing, and we are the leaders of the world in Silicon Valley, and we're, 
you know, um, and this I was mean, sort not, of pre boom, like, right? A little bit. There was a boom back then, but this definitely pre the boom now, and it was a it's another level now. But it was um, there was a bit of a boom going on. Was it a and, personal computer boom or in some other? Yeah, technology? It was kind of, uh, personal computer, yeah. I think, and just kind of computer in general. Right, boom was still going on. The second job I had there was actually for Galleon Kruger that makes bass amps and guitar amps. So when did you, so what happened? So you played bass for five years before Beavis and Butthead. Where were you living then? Um, then I, I moved to Dallas. Dallas? Yeah. You didn't okay. know what the fuck you were going to do. <laughs> Are you on any well, records? That, uh, yeah, I'm on uh, Doyle Bramhall Sr.'s, a couple of his albums. And uh, Anson, this guy Anson Funderburg and Sam Myers, they were like a duo. Yeah. They were on a label called Blacktop that was in New Orleans. That was in the 80s. So I'm on playing bass on those. And then, then other stuff. Here and there, there's uh, um, Ray Benson, the Asleep at the Wheel guy. I'm on yeah. one of his things. I just got a bunch of a big package from them. They wanted him. They pitched him as a guest, and uh, I didn't really follow up on it, but he's, he's still he's at got, it. He's got amazing stories. He's uh, Yeah, he's still at it. And then, um, yeah, so but I, I didn't have any great music. I mean, I was always just doing it because I didn't, as a way to not work in a cubicle, and I was really trying to go into writing or comedy filmmaking not stand up ever but just i knew i couldn't pull that off but i but um i wanted to i started making animated films like hmm. i finished the first one in 90 but i bought a camera and started messing with it like in 89 what what how did you learn how to do that i actually just got books at the library <laughs> for animating before yeah and uh i mean i kind of knew I just always was interested in it, so I just kind of knew. Like, what was the moment where you like, I, you know, well, it was the, doable? The moment was was in Dallas at the Inwood Theater. They're, they used to have a thing, um, the Animation Celebration, which was just every year they'd, they'd take the best animated shorts from all over the world and put them together like as a right. feature, and it would just play in indie movie theaters. And um, I would always go, just thought some really cool stuff they'd have in there. And um, in the lobby, they had cells on display of this guy paul claire hout who lived in dallas who had made a film and had gotten it in there and i was looking at these drawings and going shit there's a guy that lives in my town and he's doing this and because i always thought you had to have a ton of money or you had to buy all the equipment special machine yeah and, I, and then i thought wait i bet you can just rent the equipment what why don't i and then i got books on it and then i just got this like animation fever i just decided i'm, I'm gonna do this i'm gonna and it's you know just wrote down every idea. I was. I, I was Have you never, ever drawn? Yeah, I'd always drawn a little bit, but I never took a lot of pride in it. I would right. draw it to, to just do something. I could sort of draw. Someone would get under my skin, like a professor or someone, like when I was a musician, like this guy that I was touring with, and I would draw them. Just to, it would just I get this urge to draw them, and I, but I wasn't great. Like I can't draw landscapes and houses right. and trees, but I would just draw faces in a way that could make people laugh and. <laughs> Like so I just some butthead. Yeah, you know that that was yeah, <laughs> that sort of thing. And I would draw in notebooks and stuff, but I never took pride in like, oh look. And I tried to do some panel cartoons a little bit, um, but I don't think they were ever that great. What was, for print? Yeah, mm -hmm. but but I was that kind of wasn't my thing either. I just but uh, I mm -hmm. had a hunch that that I could make something funny if I could figure out how to put it together. But and then, you, you always gravitated towards animation. It resonated with you. There was something. Yeah, what about it a, exactly? I don't know what it is. There's like, well, stop motion was a, another thing I really wanted to do. I'm actually better at sculpting than I am drawing. Uh -huh. I mean, maybe not like, so I always wanted to do like Gumby stop motion Have you done stuff, that? Just a little bit when I first got around the same time. And then I realized that involves just a lot of hardware and building sets and all that stuff. And, too much as, work. As shitty as my drawings are, <laughs> it was like that was a quicker path to getting something done that could be funny and right. So uh, it wasn't the original stuff. So when did you make the first cartoon? The first, I had a, I bought a Bolex movie camera. It's a sixteen millimeter little single frame. Yeah. I, I, I did, I did like a, a test. I tested some animation with it, and that was eighty nine. Single frame kind of thing. Yeah, like, you, okay. you just like you got a peg bar and the paper's punched and you register it so it doesn't move and right um i finished a test and i got the film back and i was like oh my god this actually looks like a cartoon i can really do this it was like one of the most exciting <laughs> it's it and i wasn't telling anybody i, I told my wife i showed her and i'm like look look at this i can i can make a cartoon and then the what'd she say she thought it was really cool actually okay. she she uh and she was working an engineering job she had been 
physics too. So she was she was in tech in Dallas. And anyway, so I is that why you ended up there? Sort of. Well, it was it was actually started because the Anson Funderburg guy offered me a gig, and then she was saying, "Oh, look, I my company has a branch there." You know, you can and, do it. Uh, yeah, you can so, play bass, and, I can... and, and it was just so expensive to live in the Bay Area. I just couldn't. Oh, it's you know, crazy. Like, yeah, I lived there for a couple of years. But I. Um, so you do this thing. You do that, your cartoon. And then the first thing I finished with sound and everything, like I timed the track out with a stopwatch. I didn't know if that was going to work either, and that was the first. Um, it was called Office Space, and it was the character Milton and the boss coming and taking a stapler. Right. And that's how that started. Yeah. So that was the first. The first animated thing i ever finished was called office space and it was uh it was pre dilbert and it was just you know the guy with his uh you know it kind of short sleeve guy with uh -huh. his coke bottle glasses at his desk and so real basic yeah but uh that one got ended up you know i just had vhs copies i couldn't like i had i had one of those tascam four tracks with a cassette tape you yeah. know back then that so i did the soundtrack i did all the music and all the voices and the sound effects, all is kind of a radio play, and then I animated to that. That's how you do it. You know, oh, I see. Yeah. Time out every where every syllable is going to happen, and you shoot it. And I remember getting it back, and I put it in the projector, and I just hit play, going, "Fuck, this is never going to work." And just it sunk up perfectly. Oh. And I was like, "Holy shit, <laughs> this is really a cartoon I just made." And then I and the atom was split. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I split the atom of. <laughs> yeah, and then I sent out I called 411 literally like i felt so stupid as uh mtv like i just got names of anybody i could comedy central all these people and and how many when you made those calls how many did you have in the can uh two i, I two I, office I had, space i had one office space and then another one that was just a this kind of fat dumpy guy watching a health food commercial it wasn't great it was, yeah <laughs> but i put them both on this tape yeah and um mailed out like 14 copies or something like that and just and then i started getting calls it was just like really at this point i think i was 27 or so you, 20, do you get who were you getting calls from uh, i got a call from the kids in the hall believe mm -hmm. it or not i got a call from uh a show called night after night with alan havey that ended up running i remember it. that yeah the 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 yeah the, yeah, the audience one on one, one and, the audience yeah. one yeah <clears throat> i've interviewed him yeah i ran into him recently in a in a bar in Santa Monica, and I was like, "Man, thanks for." You Did he the, say them? You were the first guy to ever put me on TV, and that's yeah, amazing. He, yeah, and oh, so he ran it as a as a piece on on night after night on Comedy Central. Yeah, and they actually flew me to New York, which was amazing. And and uh, but they, you know, they said, "How many of these can you do? How fast?" And you know, I let them have that one for like I think they paid me like fifteen hundred dollars or something uh -huh. like that, and. That covered my cost and a little bit more, but for me to keep doing more of them at that price would have been, I, I was just like, I'm just going to animate other stuff. And so I ended up, you know, and, and I was getting stuff in festivals at that point. But, at that, but it's pretty work intensive the way you were doing it. Oh, yeah. It'd take me about six to eight weeks to do two minutes. So that was, I was just like, crazy. you know, if it's $1,500 and I clear $200 and I'm making them, you know, I, I already got one on their show. So it's like, that's my, you know, that, right. was, that was just a cool thing to. And then what? How? What? What happened? So you do you get a little attention? Kids in the hall, uh, but MTV didn't. Did they? Uh... No, not right away. What they? But then I, I just kept making them. So I made one called "Is This Character Inbred Jed?" That yeah. one wasn't very good. And then the let's see. And then the fourth one I did was Beavis and Butthead. It was a short called Frog Baseball. And yeah. And at this point, my stuff was playing in this in this uh, thing called Sick and Twisted animation festival and yeah it was in the animation celebration where i'd first seen it in right Dallas. that one ended up i i got to go see that play in the same theater in austin and that's cool yeah so then it was my and then there was a show on mtv called liquid television that oh, was yeah, I remember shorts that. yeah so yeah. that's they licensed uh four of my shorts and put them on there so which ones uh well i'd done at that point i'd done two beavis and buttheads so they put both of those on they put office space and they put um the inbred Jed one, and that, and that these were how long usually? Uh, around two minutes, most of them. What the second Beavis and Butthead short was like four minutes, I think, or three or four. And, and then, and, and then what and happened? Then, when, well, so then they did you do? Were they on Saturday Night Live too? Yeah, uh, um, the first thing I ever animated, Office Space, after night after night with Alan Havey, then it got on SNL actually. Just and they just how they set it up? They ran it. Um, it was on the night that. Uh, 
last time Nirvana was on there was ninety three. So Beavis and Butthead had already started going by then, but but uh I, and then I did three more for SNL and um they weren't very good. The fourth one was pretty good. I, I was just kinda it was uh, it was sort of a weird I was hiring a couple people myself to help, and just like just the timing of them wasn't great. But that you know it led to the movie. But you so. were still doing them at home. Uh, at that point, Beavis and Butthead was going, and I was in New York. But I was so I, I was Beavis and Butthead was in full production, oh, okay. so I wasn't really doing them at home. But I sort of was with those ones. It was me and two other guys in our spare time. They worked on Beavis and Butthead, and we were just animating like crazy to get these things for SNL. And like Lauren would call on a on a Friday and say, ask me if I could have one for tomorrow. <laughs> he'd call you directly? Yeah, he'd call me directly and <laughs> say, you know, we're a little short on material. Could you have one tomorrow? And I'd just say, <laughs> no, they take, with three of us, it would take like two or three weeks, you know, and so. So all this sort of kind of happened in a in a perfect storm within a year or so, you know, the, the yeah. momentum of this thing. Yeah, I went from like 90 was when I finished the Office Space one. 91, it was on Comedy Central. In 92, Beavis and Butt had happened. And and you did a deal with MTV for a series. Yeah. And, and that gave you a production schedule. Yeah. And it seems to me that, if I'm not mistaken, you sort of single-handedly saved MTV, the network, because they, they were, drifted yeah. into irrelevance and there was no one gave a shit anymore. Yeah, they, they were in... It's funny, like I didn't, I I didn't know what ratings meant. What, a, I mean, I knew that what ratings were, but I didn't right. know what the numbers. I wasn't even thinking about it going into this. And then, after the first episode aired, uh, the next day, um, Abby Turkuli, uh, kind of the exec on it, uh, comes in and says, "We got a one." And I said, "What's a one? Doesn't sound like a very high number to me." <laughs> but they never said, had normally, one. Normally, he said, "Normally that time slot is." Point six, mm-hmm. you know, so, and then the next day it was point two, it was on every day, which was just crazy. And the next day it was like one point two. By the end of the week, it was one point eight. And then, but this was this was the first uh, such week. Such a train wreck. They they had they were supposed to have something like fifteen episodes by March eighth when it premiered. And I remember this guy they hired who didn't have an animation studio. He was just uh, oh, I was just a train wreck. And he it, um. We had, we ended up having just two episodes ready. So what we did is took my two shorts and put videos in between them and cobbled together another one. And they just were rerunning. By the end of the week, there was another one coming in. So third. So one. just three episodes airing over and over again. But the ratings kept going up. And then they finally did a smart thing and just took it off the air and waited until we had more. Well, that's that's interesting because that would have been you know the 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 equivalent of viral now. That yeah. like by word of mouth. It actually probably helped you in the in long a weird run. Way, I think it did because it, everyone was like, "What? What happened to that show? Where'd it go?" And then three months later, or something like that, it you came got on you got another twelve in the with, can, and and the, and the episodes were better, and they started to get better, and yeah, so it was uh, it in yeah, in a weird way, it ended up helping. And the shorts had been on Liquid Television, and were getting a lot of buzz. So, so it just like it changed uh, it you you changed everything. Not just for you, well, but I you think know, for America. <laughs> I, <laughs> I made America stupid. <laughs> no, I, I, I was, uh, yeah, no, it was, it was, it was a crazy time. I didn't really appreciate it at the time. I mean, I was married. We had a my daughter was a year and a half old, and I was just working sixteen hour days. And we lived in a lousy condo way up in Port Chester, and I was taking the train in and just kind of Port Chester. Yeah, I don't, you, know, you know where that is? Way up, up north. Yeah, it's up uh, between Greenwich and Rye. But it, it was a, it was an amazing time because, I mean, Beavis and Butt had literally, there was something so, it resonated with so many people so quickly. And that, you know, yeah. it, it was just a matter of weeks, it seemed, before people were imitating them and, you know, showing their friends. And it was so specifically, I think what, what registered to me, and I, I guess... To everybody else is that it's a very specific American towny experience, and like yeah. that that I grew up with and that we grew up with. You know, I don't know if that, is, but I think just about anywhere. I mean, they everybody seemed to know that guy or know those guys or have gone to high school with those guys. Yeah, it definitely. Um, I mean, yeah, and that's what I heard from the get go. Is oh, I, I grew up with guys like this, and to me, it feels very Albuquerque. Yeah, but, but it's. Turns out to you know, 
the dumbasses are universal. <laughs> <laughs> but cross language barriers, maybe. But um, I don't know. Looking back on it, it at the time, it it uh, in a weird way. Uh, on one hand, I was I wasn't I wasn't surprised that people would connect with it once I got it. I felt like the first two that aired were horrible, and yeah. a lot of the early ones weren't good. But once I knew that once I got the good ones on, that it, it would at least I felt like it would connect with some people. I didn't, um, I didn't really know it would uh, be as you know get as big as it was, or or piss as many people off. Also, why did it piss people other, off? Oh, all kinds of reasons. I mean, it was it 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 landed right in this pocket when I guess the. The, I don't know the the wall had gone down in Europe, you know, like the end of the right. Cold War, and yeah. not a lot of news. And right. uh, suddenly, just right at this time, right before it came out, there was all the all of a sudden it was like violence on television and television corrupting the minds of. And then, you know, here's this show called Beavis and Butthead that's a cartoon, and everyone thought of cartoons as for kids. And yeah. So this was just, you know, our kids are watching this. Yeah, and it, and just, and it was such a. I wish it, I mean, at the time it was, there was such a just assault from the news media of just, you know, this horrible show. What are, what, what's this world come to? And, and, uh, and I wish I'd pointed out more. It took me a while to get, this is cable TV. You have to call up and order it. You have to pay your bill. You have to be there when the guy installs it. You have to take all these steps. And for these mothers to parents just to like, my kids are what look what my kids are watching. You need to change. It's like just you went and it's like going and buying Hustler magazine and leaving it on your right. coffee table and say, look what my children are looking at. You know, yeah, like but, but also it's you can, like you can lock it out. It's so easy to do. And but it, the weird thing is, is that where was the argument? It's like, well, the Three Stooges were pretty violent. Oh yeah, yeah, well, the, yeah the I know. <laughs> you know, it's not like uh, how did why when in, in specifically animation, it's like yeah. we're it's not real. Yeah, it's not I mean, real, it's, and it's not. I mean, also just you know a, a typical Roadrunner, Warner Brothers cartoon, you know Tex Avery stuff. Horrendous! With, that coyote yeah, went like through such shit. Banging people in the head with yeah. pans and you poor know. coyote. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's. Uh, I so mean, now, of, now it's kind of. I wish I John Chris Felucci. There was this thing that. Like MTV's publicity department was always just breathing down my neck. Okay, when they ask you that, they were just running afraid, running scared from every attack. On, but meanwhile, on the show. it's the greatest it, publicity the show could have. It was it was good publicity, but I, I just remember it was some I don't know Access Hollywood or somebody doing a thing about, and they had me and John Chris Felucci not together but interviewed separately, and you know here I am just being like like defending the show and being all serious, and then it cuts to John Chris Felucci saying. Every cartoon needs a good beating. <laughs> and he goes, uh, and he's he's just being funny, and it's and he, and he and it cuts to him like in front of this computer screen where there's one cartoon character bent over, and another one's just punching him in the butt in yeah. the animation cycle. And I'm just thinking, why didn't I just embrace it and be funny like that? I, I feel like I was always taking these questions too seriously, you know, right. instead of just going, hey, this is a comedy <laughs> fuck you, yeah. You know, which well, you're a serious you know, guy. Were, was it weighing on your conscience at all? <laughs> Well, I was, there was a, I mean, actually to, yeah, there, I mean, what happened was there was a couple controversies, like there was this, um, there was a thing where somebody had, this kid in a trailer park had set uh, the trailer on, he was five years old, I think, or uh -huh. four, five. Yeah. His mom left him alone with a, and there was a one-year-old in a crib who ended up dying in the fire, and when, th they were about to arrest, th this didn't come out in the news, they were about to arrest him for... I mean, her for, you know... Negligence. Ne negligence. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, he was watching Beavis and Butthead, and that's why he set it on right. fire. Um, Not that he was five. And, and then it, it blew up. Like, it was it was the first story of every major network news that night. And it was, like, Dan Rather, I remember he, he says, you know, uh, in Ohio, a uh, child died after, uh, the, you know, his kid was watching Beavis and Butthead, and, and uh, he... His opening statement of the news ended with him saying, leading us to ask ourselves, how did we ever get from Leave It to Beaver to Beavis and Butthead? <laughs> and and uh, and it was it was a little scary because it was like everyone is blaming the show for the death of a kid. Well, it came out that they didn't even get cable at that trailer park. She was just there had been another story in the news about Beavis and Butthead and somebody doing like a some kid like with a lighter or something. I don't yeah. know. But but so. 
So she just kind of was about to get arrested and blamed Beavis and Butthead, and the cops bought it. And <laughs> but, but she wasn't at home. What, like, she what, went out on a date and left the five year old and a one year old. And, and then it turned out the kid had started another fire the year before, before Beavis and Butthead had ever gone on the air. Yeah, but it's, it's so weird that they like that. And what, left matches, lighters, whatever, you know. But left the kid. He left the kid, like, yeah. Was, that wasn't, <laughs> yeah. The, the opening story was like, how do yeah. you get from Weaver to Beaver to Beavis and Butthead? Now, like, where the fuck was this yeah. mother? <laughs> I know. With the five-year-old in a trailer. That's what was, I look back on it and just say, like, why didn't MTV come out? Why didn't we just, like, they were just, oh, don't, don't do any interviews. Don't do, you know, why, I just wish... I wish I wish that I had stood up for it more and right. not been so like oh shit a child died and and you did feel bad and all these yeah you felt bad you don't want to be the guy who's going out and saying when a child just died you don't want to be the one who's going out and saying hey man my show you know <laughs> yeah where's the mother Wait, so I it mean, was you know yeah this yeah wh- how come the mother I, I blame the mother like that's the it was a very odd time you didn't want to get you didn't want to enter the dialogue because that would have put you in dialogue with you, right you, you, <laughs> yeah with yeah exactly I didn't so. But, you know, looking back on it, I don't know, I, I wish I had, um, I, I wish that they had maybe stood up for it a little more. But, I mean, I kind of, I don't know. It seemed to have done all right. <laughs> it all worked out. Yeah. <laughs> but, how were, yeah. but at that time, so this is a this is a, a huge success, then, then you had to get management and everything else, right? Yeah. And because I think we had the same, we were with Three Arts, oh, you right. were with yeah, Rodenberg. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I, was, I met you like in '95. Yeah, I, I was with Dave Becky. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I yeah, we did meet, and I, you know, I remembered. I was sort of like, "Hey, we're from Albuquerque." Yeah, you know, and, you're, and you're like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> you hardly ever meet showbiz people from Albuquerque. No, it, it's rare. I get. I think David Hyde Pierce is from Albuquerque. Isn't yeah, he? yeah, that's right. I didn't know him. I think he's younger than we are. I met so, him once. Yeah. So once you get <clears throat> management, once this thing takes off like it does, I mean, you know, what was the plan? I mean, because. Did, did, I mean, it didn't seem to me that you were calculating about having a career in show business necessarily. No, but- and it, yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, I always wanted to, I was always into filmmaking and yeah. just, that's what I wanted to do, sketch comedy or something. And, um, yeah, Michael Rotenberg, uh, they signed me from the beginning. I didn't have a lawyer at all. I couldn't get lawyers to call me back. I, through a cartoonist that I met, I can't remember who, knew, through the just newspaper cartoon, you know, world new Matt Groening's lawyer, mm-hmm. and I couldn't get her to call me back. It just I just probably sounded like some guy bullshitting. I've got a MTV wants to make the show, you know, and so before it even started, yeah. you were trying to get some, yeah. And so I ended up doing. I got a music lawyer in Texas that kind of just said, "Oh, don't sign it," and I ended up really negotiating a deal with them myself that wasn't a good deal, but it was, you know, it's kind of like the. I knew, you know, I read it. I could, you can, you can read a contract and kind of, you know, you know I, it's one were, of those things like physics though. There's a word yeah, or two in there that yeah. could, everything could hinge on a word. I mean, I knew basically, I mean, I was, but I was making two minute short films in my house. I couldn't, to, to take it to another level, I would have to do a deal with the network and they're going to have to own it. That's just the way it is, especially when you're nobody. And I didn't happened? know it was going to be a hit. I thought they were going to make some of those little MTV IDs and I would get right. $20,000 and I'd be happy and. Did you end up getting screwed? Well, I sort of, yeah, the original deal was about as screwed as you would think, but but in, in a way I didn't. They, they Their lawyer had uh, all the bad intentions of a good lawyer, but wasn't a really good lawyer. So the contract, I think <laughs> she didn't really understand that. I think she thought I was going to be doing all the animation myself. Mm-hmm. And so there was a fee that was a per minute fee. And then later... Years later, when I was renegotiating that, well, also they needed me to make the show. They realized they they yeah. they didn't know what they were doing, and just to I did the voices, and yeah. I just kind of had the whole vision and everything. And I was, you know, I mean, I was doing all the video. I mean, it was all I was doing it all. So they realized they needed me, and then you know, I was able to renegotiate based on all these kind of. They realized if I if you went by the letter of the contract, they would owe me a lot even more money. So I ended up getting. I remember. Whatever year that was, uh, finding out that I was getting paid more than Tabitha Soren, and mm-hmm. I felt pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so the second season, we were able to really. Yeah, well, the second you... season came right away. I mean, it was the season was thirty to thirty-five episodes, and they we just there was never a break. It would just do as many as you can because they were putting it on every day, right? Which was just ridiculous for an animated show. So we did probably eighty in one year, but these are fifteen-minute episodes. Right. How many still, total? It's like. I think 
total right around 200. Wow. I think when it was all in. And how much ownership did you end up with? Uh, ultimately, now, supposedly, I've got a 50-50 deal almost with them. But at the time, I had almost no ownership. I mean, I sold them the characters just kind of after months of negotiating and just going and having the deal done and then just sitting there in Dallas going, well, shit, I mean, might as well. It's not like I'm going to sit here and keep making these by myself and putting them in festivals. I'll just find something else to do. And so I just, you know, sold it to them thinking, just take some money for this and move on. If they do something with it, they do. And not knowing it was going to go full on series. And yeah. that, that they uh, withheld that information from me until I, <laughs> until you I had sold to. it to them. And were you, were you working on a computer or still doing cells? All cells. I didn't even own a computer then. I did it all on film. And even when the sh uh, the first season was done in a really horrible digital ink and paint, except for the shorts that I had done. And then the, from then on, it was all film. Okay. Uh, so it not painted computer. on cells. Yeah, never never computer other than the, those few episodes in the first season. Wow. And so, so now you're like sort of a, a – you've – like I, it seems to me that without you, you get no, you don't really get South Park. You don't like there, there. You broke open something. I might have, I, yeah, a little yeah, bit. I mean, The Simpsons was running, but that was a yeah. different thing. You know, this was Simpsons definitely opened the door for, I think, for everybody just about because. But yeah, and, and then yeah, I mean, Beavis and Butthead. I, I distinctly remember when they were talking about doing a series with it. You know, of course they would say, well, they'd look at you know when The Simpsons did this and. But there was also this weird, almost DIY quality to it. You know, there was a roughness to to yeah. the animation and to yeah. That, I think, I think I opened the doors for shitty drawings. Yeah, <laughs> being on TV. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I did. I did not frame it that way. No, but but I, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, what what I was trying to do. I I was a big fan of National Lampoon magazine and a lot oh, of yeah. cartoonists that had really kind of cool, like notebook style drawings that I and I always imagined how cool it I wanted to see this stuff animated and um in fact one of uh at the same time that the Simpsons shorts were on the Tracy Ullman show there was Mary Kay Brown MK Brown who I was a big fan of great um, great uh, yeah, animator yeah really really great stuff in National yeah, Lampoon yeah. and they animated some of her stuff for that same show it's called Dr. Nagatu it's about impossible to google cuz she spelled it with an exclamation point in the yeah. last name <laughs> Um, but it was uh, really cool. I just loved the way it looked, and and that, and also the the pacing of it. And so, when I was doing the first Office Space Milton thing, I was kind of thinking of the way that stuff looked. And she also did weird kind of de almost de dark domestic very, panels. Yeah, very like this weird woman who was teaching cooking. Yeah, and like right. Everything. Yeah, those were trippy, man. Yeah, really trippy, really funny stuff too. Like, um, and the other who else was in the back of those uh, the lampoons when they had the color comics at the back? They 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 had some S. Clay Wilson stuff in there yeah, sometimes. S. Clay Wilson. There was a bunch of uh, Mimi Pond, B. K. Taylor, all these really great stuff. Yeah, uh, and then and, and Drew Friedman. And great Harvey Picard sometimes right. I think and and uh, Bill Griffith I mean I, that that stuff to me th actually there's a guy named Mark Merrick mm -hmm. and uh, I mean I could just Buddy Hickerson all these great people that had different uh, Linda Berry like just really cool ways of drawing and none of, I'd never seen any of that animated so that was kind of I was trying to do that just animate something that didn't look so slick and yeah yeah. And partly because I just can't draw that slick. Leaf. And and then how long before like what when you chose to like I imagine that doing you know King of the Hill and conceiving of King of the Hill and and having these you know characters with emotional depth was sort of the next evolution of of you as a as a as a, a guy who moving moving towards film and, yeah. and moving towards you know sort of exploring you know like responsible adult themes and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was. Uh... Yeah, I had wanted, you know, I was a big fan of just classic television like um, Leave It to Beaver, uh -huh. The Griffith Show, Bob Newhart, especially. Yeah. I, I wanted to do something different than Beavis and Butthead, and and also they wanted a show specifically to follow The Simpsons, so I didn't want it to be too much like The Simpsons. So that's a so. huge break for you. I mean, when you know when yeah. that must have been offered to you, you would you must have been like, holy shit. Yeah, it was very. <laughs> it was a little daunting. I tried not to think about that too much, but I, I actually didn't think. Honestly, I I did this overall deal with Fox, and I've always like I always just kept thinking I'm just going to retire and do weird little stuff for fun. But but this, I remember thinking, well, 
it was very daunting, but then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to pitch a show that I want to do. I'm not going to, tr- and if if it's not what they want to do, they'll say no, and that's that. And, right. And I, I sort of kept thinking they were going to say no. <laughs> it's like, just these, like the first drawing I had was four guys with their beers and then the family, and kind of based on the neighborhood I lived in outside of Dallas. And, um, uh, but it just kept, uh, and actually in Albuquerque too, I lived in a, I had, four different Fort Worth people from Fort Worth yeah. living in my neighborhood. And I had a right. paper out for, that was... Uh, Texans are their own thing. Yeah, they they seem to find each other in Albuquerque, too. And yeah. My neighborhood was, uh, they were all, all around, around. us. Around? I mean, the last neighborhood. We lived all over the place there, but the last neighborhood I was in when I was in like high school. And all. So that was, so it was uniquely Texan in, in that way. It was really based on yeah. Texans. <laughs> kind of an, I think it's sort of the way... You know, you'll hear uh, Canadian comedy people, a lot of them will say, you know, you're right next to the United States. You can kind of observe it as an outsider. Right. I kind of feel that way being in New Mexico, growing up there, and Texans, you know, they flood our campgrounds every three-day weekend. And <laughs> yes. Remember my, my dad would just, he, uh, you know, he grew up in Montana and Wyoming, just wide open spaces, and he, he just hated crowds and and when there was these, you know, big three-day weekends and just Texas license plates, he would, he would just like be muttering, "Just goddamn Texans everywhere." <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I kind of grew up with this view of Texans. Well, they, <laughs> they think they're in their own country. There is definitely yeah. this. I was just there, and there, there's definitely this feeling that, like, you know, Texas is Texas. Yeah. And whatever else is going on out there, it's uh, yeah, that's, that's someone else's business. Well, it's, it's kind of like I mean, and once I moved there, I just loved it. But but it's it is that winning. It's the winning team that you like to hate unless you're on the team, <laughs> right? You're like, hey, we're, you know. Um, but uh, did you notice? Growing up in Albuquerque, it seemed like any time there was a middle-aged male authority figure telling you to, to do something, it was, they had a Texas accent. Like, Excuse me, boys. What are you boys doing? Move it along. Yeah. Like, yeah. But everyone else talked yeah. like a cholo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and their pants, their shirt were always tucked into yeah. uh, to like uh, Western style slacks. Yeah, yeah, and they had a tie usually. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, like in the seventies, they still had their fifties hairdos and. Yeah, slick back. Yeah, maybe longer sideburns. So that so King of the Hill ran for a long time. Did you like? I I know that like the guys who were writing with me on my show uh, did some King oh. of the Hills. Oh, they're on, oh I forgot. Yeah, Michael Those Janet, Janet great, yeah. yeah, they're they're working with me. They've been with me on the last two seasons of my show. But they they told me uh, that you know it got when you were in Texas that you were actually doing the voices and sending them in. Yeah, by they, that point, yeah, we were. Just about everybody was doing the voices remotely uh, towards the end there. Yeah, and but you feel you stand behind it all the way through. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I was, uh, I mean, you know, there was, there were some, some years, some seasons better than others, but um, I was, I started to back off being involved when uh, John Altshuler and Dave Krinsky took over because they were, I just found that they were always kind of making whatever decisions I would have made, and just the episodes got started to get really good and uh and who was running the show greg Daniels? i know this was when john ultra and dave krinsky were running. Oh, oh they were running your show he was, he was running it at the beginning i mean i was i was there a lot the first who season. was greg greg or, was yeah, yeah. And, and uh he he left to do the office uh-huh. um the american office uh sometime i don't know just, i don't know what years those were happening but um yeah and then uh a couple different people ran it, and then John and Dave took over. Probably, I don't know, the last like six seasons or something. Like and how does that work? So you, you know, you you're the creator, and then it just sort of has its own life. Yeah, you know, I way. mean, I was first season. Most of the episodes were either treatments that Greg or I had written. Dan, yeah, and then uh, how'd you get to know him? How'd you how'd you get actually, paired up with him? Three arts. Pair. I actually met him at the same comedy festival i met you at i think 95 aspen comedy uh-huh, festival uh-huh. um and he he had been on the simpsons he was conan o'brien's writing partner actually right and then he uh I'd, I'd written the pilot and done the drawings and he i was going to work on the beavis and butthead movie and you know they said you need a showrunner and and greg did a rewrite of the pilot and he did a i had the laotian neighbors moving in and the this, this social worker coming all in the pilot and he he took the Laotian neighbors moving in and had that be like second or third episode, and then um, 
added uh, the character Luan. I think he came up with. I did the drawing, but he, um, and he, he rewrote it and then just you know, uh, it was kind of a good fit because he had done, uh, he'd been working on The Simpsons. Right. He, he knew how to oversee a lot of the you know animation stuff that's really going to be foreign to somebody who's only done live action but it's interesting too that like given the simpsons the the license they take to do just about fucking anything yeah you know at the drop of a dime in in even you know family guy to a certain extent that that king of the hill still still stays true to to almost a sitcom format without without like you know with animation you can go to the moon in a frame if you want right yeah i mean and the simpsons did go go into outer space and 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 i love that stuff but i i don't know for for whatever reason, from I guess because I was basing it sort of on neighbors I'd had and stuff yeah. like that, I just kind of, I just wanted to make it realistic. And then also, I think that's the way maybe I tend to write. Although Beavis and Bud, Butthead gets a little crazy sometimes. But I was also just wanted it to be. I remember saying to the uh, one of the executives on it, you know, um, I said, well, you know, I think we uh, want to have it be different from The Simpsons and not just be just like this. Simpsons and and he kind of looked at me like, hmm, that's an interesting thought. Like, I think executive, you you never, I don't think anyone's ever gotten faulted for being exactly like something that was really hugely successful. Oh no, of course not, because in their mind, they're, they're, yeah. he, what he's really thinking is, but the Simpsons makes a lot of yeah, money it's like, for like, us. Why do you not want to be? Yeah, just, it, it, it should be exactly. Like and and so I, I realized that wasn't a good thing to say, but but I just uh, he kind of <laughs> yeah. said, oh, that's an interesting thought. I don't, I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but I mean. Then I, you know, just made the and and Greg was on board for making it, ha, you know, realistic and having the pace that I wanted and and uh, yeah. So we, yeah. Anyway, I think you were. I, I was very involved early on, and then at a certain point, I w- what I would do is just I'd be back in Austin. I would take the storyboards. And, You'd moved to Austin by that point. Yeah, and do notes on the storyboards. They have a thing called an Adam animatic, and in some ways. You know, we were in Century City, and Film Roman did the animation. They were way out in the valley, and most of the time you were on video conference or the phone anyway, right. so might as yeah. well be in Austin. You liked Austin? Yeah. And you were there for how many years? Uh, I still have my house there, I, uh, geez, from 94 till, you know, a couple of years ago. So what was the, when, how, how did Office Space happen? Well, that same deal I'd done with Fox, um... Peter Chernin, who ran the whole thing at the time, um, had also at that same comedy festival. That was a good thing I went that year. But that was a uh, he. He saw um, in, in a theater. We just ran a bunch of my stuff, including the four Milton Office Space shorts that had been done. The original one. This I was did. at Aspen ninety five. Yeah, same same year. He had seen that and just he actually he wanted a. He said that there should be a movie. This this could be a movie, the Milton character, and uh, I didn't see a whole movie in it. Well, I had wanted to go into live action actually for. I just was always, you know, I mean, when I first was doing the shorts, one of the things I was thinking of is trying to pitch myself as a Terry Gilliam animator to a sketch show. Yeah, you know, like the right, way he right, was right, to Monty right. Python, and um, that was your big plan. That was my plan. Yeah, and in fact, I actually there was a show called The Edge with Julie Brown as a sketch show almost all female on Fox and Bill Plimpton had been doing right. animated segues and he had quit and they asked me to, and it was right around the time Beavis and Butthead was getting going and I did a couple for him and then they canceled the show. But Jennifer Aniston was on that show actually. That's where I first saw her. But anyway, so yeah, that I'd been, you know, just kind of kicking around mm-hmm. live action stuff and yeah, this uh, they said. I, I said I don't really see a whole movie in the Milton character, and they got some writers to try to pitch, and nothing landed. And they said, well, what if it was? I'd had another idea, just kind of based on my time as an engineer about something like that. And they said, well, what if you just do a movie? They pitched to me a movie like Car Wash, but the workplace is your office set right. that you've got there. And I said, yeah, I could. I could try to do that. And so, Car wash. Was the, the 70s sure. movie? Oh, no, yeah, I know yeah, the course, movie yeah. well, but it's interesting. I would never <laughs> have thought that was the precedent. I know. <laughs> like, yeah, that would be the, the good thing. Like, I, how about Car Wash? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was a there was a 50-50 it's, chance you'd be like, what movie? Car Wash meets nothing that you've ever seen other than maybe 9 to 5 or something, you know. Yeah, Car Wash was like, amazing. It was Franklin Ajay. <laughs> Professor yeah. Irwin Corey was in it. Richard Pryor was in it. Remember that song? Johnny yeah. Wither. I think. Uh, well, just, yeah, it was one person after another coming through, yeah. and it wasn't. So that's what, like when 
you know, later, when I mean, one of the criticisms of Office Space was maybe it wasn't strong on story, but I would say, well, they told me to do something like car wash. <laughs> yeah, but see, I think that's a misconception about story in general, that if you have a journey, you know, what the fuck do you need a story for? Like, yeah. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? If you, well, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it is a little... I mean, what's the... the, the this, I think it's also a very easy thing for critics to pick apart going, oh, well, it doesn't have the three-act structure or the, what you know. Yeah, I mean, we, in, in, in the small experience I've had in writing television, I mean, you, you know, there's you've you got to make choices like that. But I've had... There's been some success in, you know, if the if the sort of movement through the, the, the scenes is strong enough, no one's going to be like, nah, yeah. it, does, it didn't make sense to me. I mean, you know, whatever carries right. you through to... Right, I mean, whatever carries you... I mean... You know, J.J. J. Abrams said an interesting thing when I, uh, I think I forget what script I, he used to. I used to have him read stuff, and we, I used to know him back then. But he he said, you know, you want to write he, what the way he said it, like whether it's a screenplay or a cut of the movie, you want it to be like if you give it to someone to read and they're two pages in or thirty pages in, fifty. If you take it away from them, you want them to say, wait, wait, no, give me back. I want to see what... Right. And you can accomplish that a lot of ways. It can be like right. by wanting to find out what's going to happen to the kidnapped kid. Or or it can just be, you know... Does that guy uh, ever get a state back? Yeah. Was, yeah. <laughs> or just like, <laughs> this is reminding me of people I know. I want to see what's going to happen to them. You know, there's a lot of ways to, to get that. And it's not necessarily always going to be this right. kind of, you know, simple... So how did the script end up? Simple. How did it end up? Did you write the whole script? Yeah, I wrote it. Uh, wrote it, turned it in, and then, um, to my surprise, they just kept. I just, it's another thing where I just kept waiting for it to not happen. I started to get cold feet at one point. I was just um, my producer. I, I you know, I, I said, "Well, if we're going to do it, we got to shoot it in Austin. My kids are in school. I don't want to go live in L.A. for whatever." And, and uh, I remember going like, okay, just tell me when it's getting close to too late to back out because I may want to not do this. I was just like, I don't know if I want to put this pressure on myself. Because you're going to direct it. Yeah, I was going to direct it. And I was like, also just thinking, you know, what if this, I, I couldn't tell, like, you know, what if I can't find the right cast? What if it sucks? I don't know. I was just going through all that. And yeah. I remember pulling up to, they had opened a production office and pulling up and seeing, like an 18-wheeler and people constructing sets and going, oh, shit. It's happening. This is really, like, <laughs> those people are building those sets so I can have my little play pretend with these stuff I wrote and just <laughs> and just getting sick to my stomach. And, and then, oh, Jennifer Aniston's flying in and, and the, you know, there's going to be paparazzi. I was, oh, my God, what have I done here? Yeah. And But one of the things that really tipped the scale, there was a few moments, but... um when Gary Cole came in to read for the part of Lumberg, and I, I was just going, oh, my God, if nothing else, if I can get this guy. And he was kind of basing it on what I'd done in the cartoon, but he was taking it to this other level that I was just, I'd only seen him in a made-for-TV movie where he played a serial killer. And I just thought, you know, if if I get nothing else but this guy in a movie doing that, then I, uh, at least I got that. And, so, <laughs> and Stephen Root doing Milton. And then, then it started to come around, and I just thought, okay, at least I got. I know I have some scenes that me and my brother and my old roommates and musician yeah. friends of mine will laugh at. Right. And then, you know, but it was that was that was a lot of uh, stress I wasn't used to. But the characters were so defined, and the performances were fucking amazing. Yeah, I felt like I, I remember rehearsing with Ron and Gary Cole a, a, a scene where he he's. Uh, you know, asking him uh, to come in on Sunday, and and I'm it just it's just the three of us in these cubicles. The sets had been built, and and I'm just laughing and thinking this is great. And neither of them are laughing. Right, <laughs> just they're playing thinking, it straight. Am I just making something that? And Gary Cole actually hardly ever laughed through the whole thing, except and when I realized, I was thinking, does this guy? know that this is funny or maybe it's not funny and, and why tell and, him either way yeah, and why tell he's what he's doing is was just seemed like magic to me and when there's a dream sequence where he's having sex yeah. with what's supposed to be jennifer aniston and so he has a shirt off and and uh we're about to shoot and i come up and i i would gotten the idea at the last minute to have him have the coffee cup and right. everything too and I, <laughs> I come up with the coffee cup i'm about to hand it to him and i'm so used to him not laughing right. and he just starts busting out laughing and i was like okay <laughs> gary gets say. the joke he's just so focused he's just such a focused actor and <laughs> that's, a, like, that's a hilarious beat that was just a, in the moment you're yeah right. yeah I, was, I thought you know he's had the coffee cup in every single scene why, <laughs> why, why, why? 
<laughs> and did now so did you make exactly the movie you wanted to make? Yeah, I mean, I, I I'd say I'd say just about everything in it. There was some um maybe so, like there's one thing I can think of. There's one the studio is so up my ass about everything. They did. I mean, they didn't like the the music I put in there. I fought them on that. I fought they didn't like the cast. They they fought me on almost every detail of it. So it was and I won all of them. One thing I can think of, there's one this is like petty, but there's one shot of Ron Livingston, the main guy, at the very end when the building's burning, there's one shot of him smiling that I don't like. And it was this is how much they were meddling. It was it was down to the last final edit and we're yeah. mixing and, and there's a shot where his smile looks more natural. Right. And not as big as that one. And that one didn't and and they just fought me and I was like, you know what? It's like a two or three second shot. Let him have it. And right. n- now I look at him like, ah fuck, I should have <laughs> really I won every other battle. Why should, why did I put that, that that was the one bone like, you threw them? Was it Yeah and, and it's one of the last shots of him in the movie and I'm just like, ah shit. I should have It still sticks with you? Yeah. A little well, bit. That, well, that's, but that's, I mean, if I, I I can't believe I got all those Ghetto Boys songs and all those great. I mean, I I you know that when they're smashing the printer, that song I had to fight tooth and nail to get that song in there. And and damn, it feels good to be a gangster. They didn't want that. They didn't. So it's I, I feel lucky that I got the movie. Well, the interesting thing about again is that that movie had just uh, over time and even now still kind of builds this this cult following and it's a it's a it's a reference that almost everybody knows about and and people can watch it multiple times. Uh yeah, you know, it's it, really nice to it's been really sweet for me to have people still like it, you know. Because on the release, how did it do on the release? Didn't do that well. I mean, it wasn't a huge disaster because it only cost ten million. But but over time, over oh, it's been a huge profit for them. I mean, they've made, they still make money off it. I'm sure it, it still airs on cable. They still there. It took them forever. There's this so the the red stapler. Yeah, Swingline didn't make red staplers, and I I painted it, had them painted that color so it would stand out in the right. cubicle, and so. Over the years, when it started to catch on, people would call Swingline to try to get a red stapler. They didn't know what they were talking about. There was a Wall Street Journal ar- article about this. And then someone was selling red staplers on eBay illegally and making a bunch of money. And then So Swingline just started making red staplers, <laughs> and it became their biggest selling <laughs> stapler. And it was I, – I actually originally – I think it was Boston uh-huh. staple, staplers was in the script, and Boston said, no, you can't even – we don't, our we don't want her. Yeah, and Swingline they didn't give us any money, but they said yes. Right. So, uh, so take paid that, off for that Boston staplers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or whatever you're called. Are know. they still selling red staplers? Yeah, they sell they, they sell a lot of them. It's their. I think last time I checked, it was their their biggest. That's cousin. amazing. <laughs> so, how many years between that and uh, Idiocracy? So that was ninety nine. Office Space came out. Idiocracy came out in 2006. So, yeah, to, after Office Space, I was just said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm just going to... Why? What was, your, was it too taxing, the experience yeah, of directing? You didn't like directing? Taxing, or? and also just uh, I wanted to just be there for, you know, every one of my kids' games and recitals and mm-hmm. just to just be around. I mm-hmm. just didn't want to... I was tired of always getting on a plane and flying to L.A. And you made bank. You could relax. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and King of the Hill I could do from Austin, and so... Practical. I, uh, yeah, I took it took it easy for a while, and idiocracy like it, because like and it just like and also at this time I mean now South Park's out and you know and and you are sort of this respected senior in a way. Uh, yeah. Did you elder statesman? An elder statesman, but also like you know what I started to realize about these animations about about South Park and about Beavis and about well the Simpsons to a degree is that you know the there's an amazing freedom to animation. Yeah. I mean, you can fucking you know say and do almost anything and imply almost anything and take on sacred cows or or yeah. really turn things inside out. You know, when it's couched in animation, uh, it just seems like the freedom of it is amazing. And like, I don't know what your relationship is with those South Park guys, but I mean, once that started happening, you know, it had to be impressive. Oh yeah, no, I love South Park. I, I know those guys. I've gotten to know them really well over the years, actually. And uh, in fact, I met them. I met them before South Park came out uh-huh. uh, when they had done that the, short. The Brian Boyatano. Uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Brian Boyatano thing. And, um, in fact, they came to the... Uh, were they Three Arts too? Did you... I don't think uh, they ever were. Yeah. 
Three Arts went after him, I'm sure. But they they uh, they came to the Beavis and Butthead movie premiere, and that's where they met Isaac Hayes for the first time. <laughs> he was playing because he he did he did the theme he did the opening song for the movie. Oh, really? I don't know if that if that's how they ended up choosing him, but they did. That's where they met him the first yeah, time. Yeah, at the, at the uh, Beavis and Butthead premiere. I remember those guys being there. Yeah, they they've man, I mean that they're so talented. That stuff is just. Smart and blowingly good. It yeah, stays relevant. And those characters yeah. again, like to like. I think that not that you created a playbook, but to use sort of like um, you know kids with with demented points of view. Yeah, you know the traction you can get from that is amazing. Yeah, there's also something that's that's funny about animation. It didn't occur to me till I was well into doing it, but that it's hard to explain. There's something kind of cowardly in a funny way about you know you're. You're doing these, you know. You're you're, you're doing these little drawings. And yeah. You're making fun of people and right. <laughs> you're you can do it hiding you behind this. You know, you're not putting your face on the camera. You're yeah, but it also is a you're it, able. It makes it funny to me that that you're that it's cowardly for some reason. But it's not. It's not. It's not cowardly. It's actually the most reasonable and 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 also the most accessible way to explore the things that people think or feel, but they aren't allowed to express. Yeah, that's true. You can you know. Uh, you know, there's a scene in, in uh, Kill Bill that Quentin, you know, he went into animation for this awful thing where this the girl's mother's, like, killed on the... Right. And and I remember him saying, he was, you know, I thought it was great. I thought it was a genius movie, but that him saying that, you know, I didn't want to actually drip blood on a little kid and stuff, and he went into this... Was Japanese, it anime? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. anime-style stuff. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can... You can do a lot of stuff that you would take license. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, all right. So you find what what was you know kind of uh, boiling up in you that 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 created uh, uh, the next movie. That you know, I had I had that I, I'd gotten the idea. I guess I was just thinking about evolution or something. When, and I'd gotten the idea when I was writing the Beavis and Butthead movie that um, now that we don't have predators, what, yeah. what happened? You know, nobody's. It just favors whoever has the most kids, and I was just thinking about that. And then I started thinking there could be funny something funny. I'd seen, well, the year two thousand one was coming up, and uh, I'd I'd watched two thousand one again, and just thought, wouldn't that have been funny if that movie was just you know giant WalMarts and the Jerry Springer show, and <laughs> instead of this clean right future that every high tech future that everybody envisioned right. everything's pristine and nice and right. it just doesn't seem to be going that way and so i just thought what if you just charted from the 60s to now and just kept going out in that direction for another 500 years and it was just i was also i was at disneyland with my daughters and um in line at the teacup rides and uh this this like uh this kind of this redneck mama behind me with her two little kids, like, you know, three and five years old, like mine were, I guess, at the time. Mine were a little older. but And then uh, a uh, Mexican woman comes up, and they just, I guess they had had an argument before, and they just, it's just this woman behind me just starts going, yeah, say that to my face, bitch. I'll kick your fucking ass, bitch. Come over here. And, they're, and she's yelling back, and, like, I'm just thinking – Disneyland and the teacup rides. Right. And this wasn't how <laughs> Disney, Walt Disney imagined this yeah. being, you know, and I'm just, I, I, my daughters are with me and I want to just mm -hmm. turn around and, just, you know, say something to her, but it was kind of scary. Like I, th I thought a fight was going to break out. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I just, that, that was actually the instigate. I had written the treatment for it a while before that, but I thought, thought, wow, I should really, um, I should really do something with this, and uh, that that was the moment. Yeah, that was the moment. Like, that, uh, there, there will come a time where everyone will talk like this. Yeah, <laughs> and I just broken my ankle surfing, and so I was on crutches, and I, I had a lot of time sitting down. So I just started writing it then, and then I put it on a shelf for a while. And then Aton Cohen, who worked on King of the Hill, yeah, I had Fox hire him, and then we we went and actually wrote it over a period of I don't know two or three months, just. We'd get together. It was the first time I'd written like this, where we actually wrote it in the room together, the first draft. Uh -huh. And then I went and did a rewrite later. But it was something I put on the shelf. We were looking at making it in 2002 and couldn't get anybody to be the lead in it. Nobody wanted to do it. And then I went and did a full rewrite of why it. Didn't want that? Why didn't they want to do it? I think the script wasn't... It was good. It was a good idea, but it wasn't that great. And then when it came back, I rewrote it, and maybe it was a little better. But um, I, was st I, I still... I mean... One of the things about that movie, it was sort of a bigger concept than it was a movie. To to really, it was such a 
I felt that big concept, and it didn't. I mean, I, it could have. It wasn't. That's the the weakness of it. I think it's it's a better idea than it was. Well, no, I think it's just it's that also just this, you need a big budget. That's to, right. So the, 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 that's what I read about because like it's it's pretty. Sh- it's like a dystopian satire. Yeah. You, you know, like I, I think Office Space is, you know, is a workplace satire. But they, but you were, you know, the the things you were tackling logically were huge, and and they were global, literally. Yeah, yeah. And it- so, <coughs> like, you know, you could feel that you had budgetary restraints, but that made you, <coughs> you know, lean into the actual jokes that you yeah. had. I mean, the other thing we were, well, I was I was a little afraid to make it just because it was very daunting. I, I at some point when we tallied it up, I realized we had something like sixty-five speaking parts, which is not a good idea. Cause right. To find that many people who can play convincing dumbasses and um, ended up getting a lot of my friends actually in it. But um, but uh, when Luke Wilson wanted to make it, uh, then that's when I thought, okay, this could be. I'd sort of. I remember thinking of him when we rewrote it, and when it actually that, that's kind of who the rewrite. I did was imagining him doing it just sort of as sometimes it helps you write when you're thinking of a particular actor. Right. And then uh he responded really well to it and so so yeah then it uh, we started we shot it in 2004 and then it was didn't come out till 2006. But well, I thought I'd never seen Dax before and I thought he was genius in it. I thought I, he was great. I mean I couldn't oh, yeah. believe it as a comedic performance with with this weird heart. I mean he yeah. was great. <laughs> like like there was a part of him that just just couldn't wrap his brain around the fact that he might have been human or human more human. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I loved what he. It wasn't how I imagined that character, and he. I had known him. He had done King of the Hill, and I'd met him. He came in and read for that, and it just. I just loved it. It kept. It stuck with me, and that was another one though. That there was one guy who was the head of, I think, marketing, who got it in his head that the problem with the movie was Dax's voice, and he wanted. Dax to completely loop the entire movie in a different voice and I had him do a couple scenes just to say I tried and and it just it's always nice to hear that people like Dax in that movie because I loved it and I, I I hear that a lot actually but you know it's weird how one person in a studio can oh, yes. get in your head and go like shit maybe he's right I don't know but I after a certain point though it's like you got to go like who the fuck is that guy yeah, <laughs> you know, like you know, they're like it's it's weird that you know it's someone real... can say something with authority and make he he made everybody else there believe it too. It's right. It's real. It's interesting because you can assign blame to an entity, but then when you yeah. realize it, it's like it might just be one asshole. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it's like who the I hell is that? What, guy? Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I just had this realization recently. Like everyone who assigns blame to corporations or I mean, obviously there's blame there, but it usually uh, it comes down to yeah, like this one, uh, one douchebag <laughs> yeah. who's gonna you know. But, and uh, then that douchebag keeps getting promoted, usually. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened with that movie, ultimately? You feel like you made the movie you could make or you wanted to make? I mean, that one I could I could go, well, I wish this scene looked better. There were scenes... It, I felt like it was cursed from the beginning. It was, it was uh, you know, it was supposed to take place during a drought. We shot it in Austin during one of the wettest summers ever, so we were constantly having to kill grass. But... <laughs> dirt down yeah, and yeah. just i mean it was a uh, big undertaking yeah and it was i mean i felt happy with what what we had to work with how fast it had to be done and everything that it um i felt like i did as good as i could have done with i mean like i say i do feel like it was maybe a bigger concept than it was a movie and it, that was tricky but i think i mean we we got it in on budget there there wasn't you know uh we had to cut a lot of you know, I wish I could have spent a little more on special effects. I mean, there was, I was getting so tired of, you know, they, we came in on budget and they said, you know, you're going to be over on special effects, but don't worry about it. Every movie's like that. And then we did a test screening where there was literally just drawings of stuff like the Washington Monument where you can't, no <laughs> right. matter how much you prep an audience, it didn't go well. And so then they just started saying, and they had promised me, you know, Oh, we won't use this test screening against you. This is just to see how it plays. And then they immediately said, this didn't score well. We need to cut the effects budget. And we, so I ended up having to, they were nickel and, dime, nickel and diming me on effects so badly. There was a point where I, I just said, look, I'll, 
I'll pay for this myself. I'll pay $30,000 to not have another one of these meetings. I don't, and I actually ended up, uh, without even telling them, I, Robert Rodriguez has in Austin, he, you know, he has his own special effects people, and he said, he said look, I'm in between movies. and I Because he finally got frustrated with effects companies and just said, I'm going to hire my own He's got people. his whole operation down there. Yeah, right? and, and so they actually did a couple effects shots. <laughs> it's like... Just to help just out? Free, yeah. And, just, just, well, and, and they, were, they were as good as any... We had gotten, and we just put them in the movie. I think we gave them a special thanks. I hope we did. Um, you, you guys are but, friends, yeah, yeah. Because like you do voices in his in the Spy Kids movies, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm in the I'm in a couple of those. I'm in all three of uh, the first. What's the character? Three. Donegan. Uh huh. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I think he. Uh, I'm the missing agent in the first one, so a lot of it's my picture. Uh huh. And I think he painted himself into a corner with that, and had to had to have me in the. <laughs> The other two, but it was it was really fun to. Oh, so those uh, are those aren't, being those, on, those aren't animated. They're, they're uh, not yet. They might be making an animated version, or maybe they have. So you actually you're the guy. You're, I'm actually you're, I'm actually in those things. Yeah, and I'm in see. I'm in Office Space also. I'm uh, I'm the manager talking about the pieces of flair. Yeah, do you uh, like? I'm acting? always wearing a mustache. I, yeah. When it's the right um, when it's the right thing. I mean, I I, I think. Uh, I'm happy with what I did in Office Space, and, yeah. uh, but usually, like like in the Spy Kids movies, I'm basically sort of a I'm the asshole cop with a mustache type That's thing. Good. And I think you could get better people than me to do that. Like I, I was doing a lot of just kind of exposition and stuff. It was mm-hmm. really fun to do though, just because you know my my kids were in that age group where they were watching those movies. Oh, so, and so yeah. my dad, yeah, and and, that- and also just watching Robert. Like I, I learned a lot watching the way he works, which is different than a lot of directors. So. And then you're friends with the Jackass guys, apparently. Oh, yeah. 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 They're good guys. Knoxville's a great guy. Oh, yeah. I love that guy. Yeah, he's great. Good yeah. spirit. There's a good There's a good uh, American spirit to those movies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, I we, really love those movies. There's I very few movies I've seen twice in the theater, and I, I saw the first one twice in the theater. And it still worked? Yeah. Oh, it God. Was... The, the, the first time you see the first Jackass, that's like a big day. Yeah. Because you can't, <laughs> like right out of the gate, you're, you're like, what the fuck is yeah. happening? And it's, it's just great. pure funny. The spirit of it is just yeah. so. It's, yeah. it's like, and it's all it's life. It's there. You know, yeah. there's people risking their lives. Yeah. <laughs> for your entertainment, you know, yeah. literally in the in the rawest way possible. Yeah. Now I I'll be honest with you. I did not see extract. Oh, it's fine. Uh, yeah. No, I'm going to watch uh, it. It was a. Yeah. What happened? Uh, it was a <laughs> that was just a. That was a little movie I made. Uh, in a sort of at a not great time in my life, and uh, yeah. it, it it did. It was very low budget, and uh, there's some good stuff in it. I think Ben Affleck's amazing in it. A lot of good performances. In what it. was the seed of the idea? Um, that started with just a friend of mine talking about being married, and just uh, and we were just hypothetically talking about uh, a guy who wanted to get divorced and hires a gigolo to see if his wife will cheat on him. And right, and then but then also I had an idea about a, a guy. Adam's extract was a. You'd see as you're driving south of Austin, they make extract. And I had a separate idea about um, just kind of a a crazy kind of criminal girl who was really hot coming into the mix, kind of based on something that had happened, someone I'd known. And and I was writing these scenes actually a while ago and just kind of combined them. And I don't know, I just had it lying around for a while and just um, put it together. And Jason Bateman wanted to do it. And... uh, I don't know. I thought it was. I, I I like it. It's not. It uh. It didn't do super well, but it also hardly cost anything. So right. I mean, I think everyone. It was it was uh. Mostly private investors paid mm-hmm. for it, and then Miramax came in at the end, and everyone got, got their money back. Yeah, I think everyone did all right on it. It's still. It was last a year ago. It was in the top ten iTunes. Oh yeah. Downloads. Yeah. So it's. I mean, it gets. It gets some uh, some traction here and there. Is it it's picking up a little cold following? Yeah, um, yeah, it seems to be. I got I got to watch it. I apologize yeah. for not. Oh, no, no, fine. Well, well, you know, I, I I've done all I can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I enjoy Silicon Valley a lot, and I'm not easy. And in and, and some of the and some of those guys, like I have personal problems with <laughs> as a comedian. <laughs> That's right. You. Uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of them are. Well, yeah, you got. Uh, well, you well, you've worked with Kumail, right? I've worked with Kumail. I've worked with TJ and Josh Brenner is actually my assistant on my show. 
Uh, oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. I forget, and, and, I forget that you got, yeah. Yeah, so he, you know, him and I actually have an on-screen relationship. But, like, Kumail and I, I know I respect these guys, and they're funny guys, but, like, you know, I'm a cantankerous fuck sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but, and T.J. Miller, like, sort of as a person has always sort of annoyed me. But uh, uh, he's fucking, he's he's great. And I know him. And, I, you know, and I'm, yeah, I'm, you know, uh, can, I'm a known, can be annoying. I'm a known cranky bastard. No, he's a- <laughs> but he's great in that. And Kumail's great. And everybody's great. And I just had um, uh, Martin Starr in here uh, oh, that's recently. Right. Yeah, he said he, he yeah. Said he but the show's really funny. I mean, it's just purely funny. And oh, it's like the, the, the world you created with those comic characters and the idea behind it, it just, it all equals great comedy to me. And I think people are responding to it that way. What was the evolution of that idea to, uh, to screen? That started with uh, a couple that John Altshuler and Dave Krinsky, who were on King of the Hill, had, um, John had talked about uh, an idea with engineers. And, that, you know, I obviously, I'd, like, I had known that world. And he was talking about um, doing something sort of like Falcon Crest or Dallas, but about the about tech money instead of right. oil or wine. Scott Rudin had pitched me an idea about gamers. They had bought the rights to some story, I think. And I just know video games. I don't know enough about that. And right. that's something if you get it wrong, they're just going to, yeah. you just get yeah. hated on. Yeah, on Reddit. Yeah. You, you'll, and, be, you'll be washed up on yeah. Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I, so I said, well, what if, you know, would, would you want to do something like this about startups in that world? And, um, Shot the pilot, and then uh, when it became series, uh, Alec Berg came on to co-run it with me. I think that the casting is pretty uh, yeah, amazing. That you know, the the you know, Middle Ditch is great. TJ's great. Yeah, I think they're. I think they're um, such a great. In the way they always. Well, that I mean, everything yeah. hinges on you, you know that that dynamic. You know, and they all yeah. seem to settle into their characters so beautifully, and they're so. You know, the comedy doesn't seem like you've created a world where you can go a bit over the top because they all want to go over the top. The, the nature yeah. of, of their ostentatiousness yeah. is, is, is over the top. And these are people that don't really know how to do that. So, yeah, that's what's interesting about the world is these people have so much, there's absurd amounts of money going into the, into this world and they're people who don't quite know how to enjoy themselves or they, they don't, they wouldn't know how to flaunt it if they tried really. And they, they don't really want to. And I mean, it's just, it's, yeah, it's pretty crazy. And, and, uh, yeah, the cast, I think I I love the cast and they actually, um, geez, I think all of them, except all the main people you see on the poster and then Josh, who wasn't on the poster, but is, you know, main character in the show plays big head. All of them read for TJ's part for mm-hmm. Ehrlich. Mm-hmm. And then I went back and sort of... I mean, we had some other characters in there, but you know, we had a Satanist and whatever. But then like seeing each of them had certain qualities that I recognized in the world of engineer nerd types. And so I went back and kind of tailored, just kind of wrote to the way they played it. Right. And, and it's just the way they all gelled, I could tell right away shooting the pilot, just when they all sat down... They all sat down in that main room in the places basically that they are in the show. Like Martin sat in the corner, right? And I just like, yeah, okay, this works. <laughs> you two over there, and TJ kind of wandering around, and um, and I didn't realize they all had this. Imp- I, I didn't know. I, I knew Thomas, and I'd worked with TJ, but I didn't know that they all had these. I didn't know Kumail was a stand-up. I didn't know right. that they all knew each other from improv and all from these, Chicago. I yeah, think TJ and yeah, Kumail, anyways. And Thomas, yeah, they go way back, and then Martin, and then actually Josh was in a, when he was, I don't know, like 12, was cast in a movie that I was producing that didn't, ended up having the plug pulled on it, but... um, Really? Because he's from Houston, and it was a local... Oh, really? Hire, and and he, he came up to me while we were shooting, he goes, hey, do you remember this movie, I think it was called El Camino Love Story, and uh, yeah, what, he's like, yeah, I was, I can't, can't remember the character's name, so I was just like... Oh my God! I totally remember you, but he was a kid then. But um, what's interesting about these characters is that the, the way their 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 innate vulnerabilities as sort of overly intelligent nerdy guys plays against their ego. It, like there's always yeah. going to be this weird. They're they're never going to be able <laughs> to to get rid of this this inherent you know vulnerability that right. comes from their intelligence and their 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 nerdiness. Yeah, you see it. Uh, I mean, you see it all the time. I've I've uh, I've met a lot of big tech billionaires, and they're still 
socially awkward, and some of them are even a little Asbergery, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, this totally reminds me of what you know, like the guys I knew at, in physics and in, and in Silicon Valley who are just super smart to create a world where that can really work and and to have it be as and to have that type of character and not make fun of that type of character and that like you know martin Starr, you know to, to have him be a satanist and just sort of be matter of fact about it <laughs> yeah. is is it's just beautiful like they yeah. like usually these you know that cast of characters are punchlines and here you know they're driving the narrative and they they all have a fully you know rounded human component to them that they're sympathetic they're not they're not uh, they're not punchlines, and, and yeah. they have an inner life, and 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 it, there's a vulnerability to all of them that's just great. Yeah, that was that. Yeah, that's uh, that's what the goal was, you know, to make it. Yeah, and like this Satanist thing was, you know, every time I've met or heard of one, they're not. They're like science fiction club or something. <laughs> well, yeah, really and like, it's like, and even the head of the uh, Satanist uh, church, Anton Lavey, was like this this huckster. He was a carny. Yeah, yeah, he was totally, a, yeah. uh, you know, it was a it was a goof. But it's yeah. it's really just about like sort of like do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah, yeah, and and it's you know some odd people joining a club. Well, it's it's funny because it's sort of like the it's it's like what swingers really look like. Yeah. Like you know you ever, <laughs> right. you, ever you ever see like pictures exactly. of swinger parties? They're like it's like a yeah. trailer park. Well, we you know? we had this we had this book and there was a uh, there's a picture of a satanic baptism and it's just like fat, weird, unattractive <laughs> people naked and just standing there with these. Cheap, almost paper mache looking goat heads right. and stuff like that. And it's, just, it's the human component. Like when when you'd hear about Satanism in the eighties, it was always like Pat Robertson or somebody talking right, about this right. dark evil force right. out there that we need to combat. And when you really look at it, it's just a just yeah, a yeah. ragtag group of weirdos. Right. They wanna fuck yeah. one you know, in different yeah. places. In right. <laughs> well, great job, man. It was great talking to you. I appreciate you coming down. Yeah, thanks. This was fun. That's it. That's the show. How cool was that? Talking to Mike Judge. Albuquerque, man. You know, I felt it, man. I felt the connection. I felt the connection, the Albuquerque connection to the animation. Uh, I just wanted to say our theme music is by John Montagna. Other music on today's episode was uh, by DJ Copley. Right now, we'll do some of my music. Go to WTFPod.com. 